back once again with the Collins Brothers. It's been a while since I've talked to two of my favorite researchers. I have Philip and Paul Collins with me again. Uh, they are this time working on a new book. Uh, it's going to be Invoking the Beyond. I'll let them tell the listeners about that. But Philip and Paul, how are you guys doing? Not bad. Hi, Jay. Not bad at all. Glad to have you guys back again. Uh, before we get started, why don't you, if you would, just go ahead and tell us again, uh, since my site's gotten, I guess, quite a, uh, a, a, well, a better audience than it had before, so we're going to have a lot of new listeners that might not be familiar with uh, you guys' research. So if you want to, just briefly, tell us about your background and how you came into all these strange subjects. You want to start with that, Philip? Or? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> well, I'll just give uh, my overall uh, academic resume. Um, I have a uh, bachelor's of both uh, liberal studies and communication studies, in particular communication studies in cat media criticism, semiotics, uh, and uh, investigative journalism, and I have a uh, minor in uh, philosophy. Um, and uh, my uh, interest in uh, these topics uh, began, interestingly enough, with a uh, science and religion course. Um, in that course, uh, I discovered that um, the uh, rigidly scientific outlook, uh, the outlook that uh, basically bestows epistemological primacy upon what is empirically and quantifiably demonstrable and jettisons uh, all qualitative data, all recounts of data uh, in favor of this uh, strictly uh, empirical and quantifiable uh, uh, methodology mm -hmm. uh, also leads to uh, the uh, erection of a societal, uh, a societal model that does not dignify the spirit, that does not dignify uh, the uh, liberty of the individual, basically in the words of the F. Skinner, it de homunculizes man. And uh, that became uh, kind of the uh, thesis for our book, The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship. The first edition was uh, published, if I'm not mistaken, in 2003. An updated, an updated, revised, expanded edition was published in 2006. But it was in that book that we examined uh, the concept of uh, a scientifically regimented state, right. uh, which is basically the logical consequence of the extrapolation of science into uh, fields that lay outside its vocational ambit, particularly uh, political science and uh, governance, when science is extrapolated into those uh, areas of study, uh, it invariably becomes an oppressor. We have the emergence of what Aldous Huxley called in Great New World Revisited a scientific dictatorship right. in this term is used interchangeably with the term technocracy, which in classic political terms uh, denotes a system of rule by uh, experts, by uh, policy professionals, by scientists, and by uh, technicians. This idea can be traced as far back as Sir Francis Bacon, who in the New Atlantis supplanted uh, Plato's philosopher Keynes with scientists and technicians. Right. The, uh, the development of that idea uh, can be traced through several other theoreticians such as uh, St. Simone um, and St. Simone's uh, protege, Auguste Comte, and um, then it, it found uh, tangible expression through such uh, societal models as uh, communism, fascism, uh, in some instances, uh, some variants of uh, liberal democratism, uh, neoconservatism, and what have you. But um, the, one of the uh, thematic uh, invariants amongst these uh, societal models is this soteriological view of knowledge. And that's derivative of the ancient Gnostic uh, concept of gnosis. Um, now that the gnosis uh, uh, being for salvation through knowledge, um, that gnosis was uh, ontologically transplanted here 
within the uh, confines of the physical universe by uh, humanists in the 1300s, um, who eventually became uh, speculative Freemasonry. And uh, that gnosis now has become a socio-political gnosis, uh, a secret knowledge uh, that allows for the possessors to allegedly uh, actually reconfigure reality to their own uh, to, to their own uh, life. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry for going a wee bit tangential there, but no, that's that, fine. That, yeah, that that entire thesis arose from my uh, education in philosophy, particularly the topic of science and religion. Um, but I also bring to uh, the uh, table my uh, education in communication studies and semiotics, uh, my education in media criticism, and uh, then, of course, uh, some investigative journalism. And my studies in liberal uh, studies allowed me to break in literary criticism and, uh, you know, English, uh, in particular, English literature and what have you, and, and, and study these uh, topics through that particular optic. Right. Uh, Paul, on the other hand, Paul has more uh, uh, a background in the more concrete uh, elements of, of political science. So I'll, I'll let him delineate his uh, resume for the edification of the audience. Yeah, my political awakening really started uh, probably when I was a teenager in uh, the, the latter years of high school in, uh, in Colorado. Uh, Colorado, back when I was a teenager, was a really uh, real anti-authoritarian kind of state. Uh, there, it was, it was, it, there was an environment there that uh, encouraged, uh, you know, questioning authority. Uh, I ran with a with a real anarchist crowd when I was when I was younger. A lot of a lot of kids that were involved in the anarch and the whole idea of the anarchy. And um, and uh, I myself never subscribed to that. For me, that was always the uh, extreme version of libertarianism. Yeah. Libertarianism itself kind of being derivative of enlightenment rationalism. So it's really drawing from the same, same uh, springs, the same right. pool as, as the uh, power elite uh, draws from. And it, in, in my opinion, it eventually had the same trajectory as the power elite. Right. Uh, basically, a... Uh, 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 a world, uh, a world order uh, built around the contours of elitism and, and oligarchy. Um, a virus derived from the same condition. Basically, yeah. two two sides of the same coin that descend from the Enlightenment. One of which being this sort of uh, stressing radical individualism, and the other side stressing uh, the collective uh, super state. Exactly, exactly. And if you look at the libertarian side of things, they usually uh, they usually encourage a kind of uh, uh, free environment, free of all restraint, free of any regulation that will allow for the rise of corporations that in turn act as the locus of power for uh, for elites. Exactly. For the, the, the power elites. Yeah, it, 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 the, the dialectical commonality being that uh, the corporation become, becomes the de facto uh, government and, uh, or, well, de facto state. And, yeah. uh, the state in Marxism, um, becomes a de facto monopoly. So it's, it really, it, 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 in either case, you have a monopoly. Right. But that being said, there, there are some excellent critiques coming out of the libertarian orbit, uh, of statism. And there was some actual, uh, excellent critiques of statism, uh, coming out of that, those circles of, you know, of, of anarchist kids that I ran with. Right. Later, uh, when I went to college, I had a teacher who was um, during during his time in Vietnam. He was he was he, he was Marine, but in, during his time in Vietnam, he went to work for the Central Intelligence Agency, and he had a lot of interesting stories to tell. And he basically uh, basically let us know without going into great depth or detail, that the, that the direction of the world is largely a result of the manipulation of social change by 
several different factions, powerful factions that work in the world, right. including the Central Intelligence Agency and those uh, those uh, elite deviants that that are behind the agency. Um, uh, so that really that really got my political awakening uh, in high gear. I, I obtained a degree. Uh, a bachelor's degree in uh, liberal studies and, uh, with a political so, uh, science minor. And as, uh, during my studies in political science, I read a lot of what you and I would consider to be the foundational books as far as this topic goes. Uh, Tragedy and Hope, the Anglo-American Establishment, right. uh, The Power Elite um, by C. Wright Mills, uh, uh, Empire in the Minds of Men by James Billington, and that really informed a lot of a lot of my thinking and really set me on my on my way. And it was finally around after shortly after September 11th that I really started writing about the topic because I saw at that time September 11th was a watershed moment for the semi-submerged. Uh, self-replicating elite and uh, it represented an acceleration in their plans and um, so the time was probably short to write about any of this yeah and, you know my, my my thinking was well you know history should it, it, history in, in, in the in the future should be able to record that somebody was was warning people that somebody was saying something you know somebody was warning about the car wreck uh miles miles back before it happened yeah well i think that for uh a lot of us who attend you know state universities especially uh universities that end up having very odd connections like that we are often sort of dumbstruck i guess by the um openness, I guess, of all of the architecture of the world. In other words, uh, you know, so many of my professors were quite blatant about um, exactly what you're talking about. You know, that yeah. this is how the world is run. Uh, yeah, okay. We may not like the term New World Order or whatever, but uh, here's a whole uh, section of the library downstairs that's devoted to, uh, you know, globalization, globalism, and here are, you know, 100 books in our library that deal with that very topic, uh, you know, all of which very much open, nothing hidden, nothing uh, sort of hidden in plain sight, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. And uh, so definitely the university experience for me as well. Right. Um, Absolutely. You know. I, I think that the problem isn't a lack of information, and I don't think that that the problem is that, that there's been a suppression of that information in universities. I think that the problem is um, is one of interpretational conformity. Right. They present you with this information, but then tell you that you're supposed to interpret it thus and so. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, it's like if you, as you, as you know from Tragedy and Hope, uh, as you're reading Quigley, it's all painted in this very positive light it's it's as if well you know yeah the world is run ultimately by the bank for international settlements and all these different uh elite uh combines and think tanks uh but it's 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 not uh there, there's nothing bad about that it's, it's all rosy he, and this is this is all for the good he seems he, he he paints it up as very very euphemistic as a matter of fact the tragedy is the failure of the plan. The hope is the cabal. Exactly. It, if you know that's it's, it's just this inverted reasoning and everything, and that's where the title of the book comes from. The hope is the hope is found in this infrastructure that evolved out of the uh, out of John Ruskin and right. uh, his disciples and the Rhodes Milner Roundtable Axis. That that infrastructure represents the hope to quickly. The yep. tragedy is if they are unsuccessful right. and everything. So it's almost, it's almost the truth told in a very inverted kind. Of, it's, it's almost reading, uh, reading a reading a Bible that presents the devil as, as the protagonist and God as the antagonist. <laughs> it's inverted hermeneutics, so to speak. 
but it's all very it's it's just so it's all dry and just very well yes this is what this is you know it's dry it's 1300 pages and it's so dry that the average person unless unless they they find this topic interesting really needs it distilled for them they really need it broken down and and uh that's what we tried to do that's what we tried to do with our our last book right that's what we're trying to do with this this newest book it's a herculean task all right i bet all right so let's let's transition there so uh we, sure. we've heard about your awakening that's that's you know at, similar to my own tell us about the idea for the new book which i understand is going to be entitled uh, invoking the beyond correct that is correct that is correct well the idea for the new book uh, really and i'll probably be uh retreading familiar ground for you giving your extensive background of what the philosophy. So, forgive me if this sounds weird. No, no. Uh, this, I mean, there's a lot of, of of listeners who you know won't be familiar with the, all the Kantian you know ideas. So, uh, expand as you as you wish. Sure, sure. Well, the, this 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 concept, the beyond, um, being really a uh, really a. a uh, if you want to get down to it, it's a, it, it, it's a narrative construct, a uh, socially and politically expedient narrative construct that is invoked by uh, the uh, would-be oligarchs, uh, uh, those who uh, constitute the, uh, I guess, the transnational elite. Uh, it's, a, it's a narrative construct that they invoke um, so as to uh, provide a, a deus ex machina um, that is uh, uh, more or less uh, expedient uh, for their ends. But the beyond um, really arises from what we call the Kantian rift. Um, that's an appellation that we assign to the epistemological disjunction between phenomena, that is to say appearances, and humanon, or the thing in itself. Um, or the, you know the 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 the, the, the actual the actual uh, essential objective reality of things. Yes. But this uh, bifurcation was imposed upon the epistemology by Enlightenment theoretician Immanuel Kant, who of course lived from 1724 to 1804. Um, but clarity of definition. Very important philosophical discussions such as these. So, for the edification of the audience, I will try to define phenomenon and noumenon as simply as possible. Basically, phenomenon refers to object, objects that are uh, discerned through sense perception. Uh, phenomenon are observable occurrences. Right. In epistemological term, the terms phenomenon is uh, empirically and quantifi uh, quantifiably demonstrable, and as such, phenomenon falls within the vocational purview of the physical sciences. In contradistinction, noumenon refers to objects that must be discerned independent of sense perception. In the original uh, German, uh, noumenon is basically the thing on seek, the thing in itself. And Kant's invocation of the term and its relation uh, to phenomena really has been a topic of debate in philosophy. Um, in the pre-Kantian world of ancient philosophy, Noumenon held uh, spiritual and even theistic implications. Uh, for instance, you had uh, uh, platonic ideas and forms which really qualify as noumena. Uh, the platonic realist Plutus regarded Plato's forms as thoughts within the mind of God. But in keeping with the uh, characteristic scientism of his Enlightenment heritage, uh, particularly uh, the influence of uh, David Hume, Kant uh, stripped Numenon of its spiritual and transcendent value. And Kant's redefinition of Numenon gives rise to all sorts of terminological confusion. For instance, Schopenhauer, he criticized uh, Kant for changing the meaning of Numenon, which originally meant uh, that which is thought, because uh, Numenon is etymologically derived from the Greek uh, term, uh, which is uh, related to the word nous, nous which right. means mind. mind. But in the context of Kantian metaphysics, Numenon no longer has any relationship with mind. Right. But this terminological confusion aside, 
Kant's bifurcation of uh, noumenon and phenomenon would play an enormous role in shaping the ideational marketplace of modernity, because essentially Kant argued that knowledge independent of the senses was impossible, and thus the objective reality underpinning sensible objects was, for all practical purposes, unknowable. All that could be known was phenomenon. Uh, noumenon was kind of shrouded in this epistemological fog, and thus knowledge now is restricted to the phenomena, and the discipline of metaphysics, as a result, is banished from philosophy, right. because it's uh, vocationally circumscribed by Kant's arbitrarily imposed just junction upon noumenon and phenomena. So philosophy must make all of a sudden these unreasonable concessions to science, because science must work within the constraints of quantitative and empirical investigational methods. Findings that might be yielded by non-empirical means are deemed recalcitrant and summarily jettisoned. Right. So Kantian metaphysics, we see, gives rise to fideism and uh, scientism, which have not just contributed to the decline in the social significance of religious ideas and institutions, but also to the rise, as I mentioned before, of scientific so the totalitarianism. Uh, fideism rejects the complementary roles of reason and faith, thereby paving the way for anti-intellectualism and mood that pervades fundamentalism. Right. And it also paves the way for pragmatism and agnosticism. Now, while it's true that faith in supernatural truths is ultimately motivated by uh, revelation, the allocation of faith and trust in that sublime experience must be guided by reason. And unfortunately, fideism denies reason its due and elevates faith to its detriment. And in the absence of reason, faith becomes blind, which is basically a hallmark of superstition. Clearly, legitimate faith is not so credulous, uh, a fact that's attested to by the scriptures themselves. Any Christians out there in the audience will know what I'm talking about uh, just by looking at First John chapter 4, uh, verse 1, where uh, the Apostle John uh, exhorts uh, believers to test the spirits, try the spirits whether they are of God. So evidently, the believer is not uh, simply supposed to be uh, credulous. They're not supposed to give their assent to any voice that uh, speaks to them, they have to try the spirits, they have to test yeah. them. So, not only does fideism undermine intellectual knowledge, but it logically undermines faith as well. It subverts both. Now, if I, yeah, could, if I could interject, I was, go ahead. Sure, 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 no, please do. Well, I'm just thinking uh, uh, of the, the fact also, as I'm sure that you're going to bring up, um, it's not as if the transition to um, the rationalist scientific methodology is somehow immune to the same types of criticisms that might be made of a position that ultimately relied on something like, quote, revelation. In other words, uh, we're going to find all of the, in other words, simply um, saying that you believe in the scientific method or something like that doesn't uh, uh, accept you from all of the, um, difficulties that come along with um, certainty in knowledge or, or uh, certainty in, exactly. in right. Exactly. Right, right. I mean, a hypothesis on Fingo is a myth. The, the, yeah. The, 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 for instance, the, the, just, because, just because you've adopted a purely empirical approach doesn't mean that your findings are going to be bereft of biases, for instance. Sure. That, 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 so you're the, the, the Largely, uh, the uh, uh, data is going to be subjected to uh, a, a particular interpretive lens, a particular right. optic, and, and so there's no reason to suppose that just by virtue of the fact that these qualify as scientific findings, that they are going to be somehow objective. Um, right. It's the, so you still have some, uh, you have the, the same uh, uh, epistemologically problematic uh, factors that one might argue uh, the sets of revelation, you still have those present with the scientific method. Sure. Right, right. Let me, so let me, inter let me interject this question. How do we, 
you made the claim, and I'm, not, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, you made the claim that the power elite uh, see some relevance to uh, the Kantian idea of the beyond, the noumena. How do you how do you get how do you get that? Where where do we get any idea that somehow power elites have some usage for um, the noumena for the beyond? Ah, okay. Well, basically that 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 is the the, the way that the noumena becomes expedient for them is by way of this Kantian uh, this Kantian riff. The it's uh, of course from the the perspective of Kant man becomes this lost uh, cartographer, and no matter how meticulously he draws his maps, no matter how he tries to define the contours of reality itself, the geography thereof remains unknowable to him, perennially so. His epistemic compass will always betray him, because he's hardwired to interpret uh, the, the uh, data in a particular manner. He's yes. hardwired to structure reality in uh, such a fashion that um, he cannot, he can never really know reality. And so we have, we have now this, this, this beyond in the place of uh, what uh, uh, Kant would have dubbed transcendent illusions, which, would, which he would have considered the uh, soul, heaven, God, in, the, in their place is the beyond, which is situated outside the experiential limits of humanity. Uh, this beyond confounds man epistemologically and ontologically. But when you have the, when, when, you, when the beyond begins to out, its, its numinal qualities begin to outstrip the world, uh, uh, and outstrip uh, the, uh, uh, in particular, the vocations of politics and international relations, that is, that provides the uh, power elite with a very compelling rationale for the imposition of some sort of managerial model. Yes. Uh, the beyond, in their view, must be managed. Otherwise, national governments will succumb to the forces of global anarchy. And that that's that's their rationale. We, 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 you face you face forces that are epistemologically and ontologically overwhelming legitimate national governments, such as, uh, and, and these are just a few of the, the uh, socially and politically expedient masks that they place upon the beyond, such as international terrorism, uh, uh, environmental calamity, nuclear annihilation, and fantastical, though they sound, yes, even extraterrestrial yes. In, uh, uh, invasion. Which is going, which is going to be important here in a, in a little bit, but Absolutely. if I might add, also uh, it's very telling that Kant wrote an essay uh, himself about world government. Right, right, exactly. Um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm groping here. I think it, he called it the cosmopolitical plan. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, it, 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 and again, this is because this is. Because this is because you have you have this this socially and politically uh, expedient uh, narrative construct that uh, you graft on to uh, the unfolding script of international relations and of of, of of governance, and that 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 narrative construct is the beyond. The beyond invades the, the invades the world of international relations and of politics with its numinal qualities. It cannot be known. It cannot be uh, apprehended. And st suddenly, now we have uh, this uh, this uh, technocratic uh, uh, circle of policy professionals uh, 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 arrives on the scene, such as, for instance, through through think tanks such as the the Rand Corporation and everything, theoreticians with the Council of Foreign Relations, with the Trilateral Commission, any number of, of these. Uh, uh, cults of uh, expertise, so to speak, uh, proffering uh, the solutions uh, to the, to to uh, this, the, this problem of the beyond. And again, the beyond manifested itself when we examine uh, it in its various manifestations in this book as uh, international terrorism, as environmental calamity, 
right. nuclear annihilation and, of course, as extraterrestrial uh, invasion, um, all of which are uh, crises that ought to epistemologically overwhelm legitimate, legitimate national government and governments and basically provide the rationale for the imposition of a managerial model that is not quite so democratic um, anymore. Well, it's actually more so technocratic. Yeah, so essentially we could look at it like um, Plato's uh, idea of the, um, you know, the sort of the civic model of religion or the noble lie uh, right. uh, taken, or, uh, taken, taken, right. taken with, with maybe, maybe if we took like Joseph Campbell's, you know, masks of God idea and it, it doesn't really matter what is from the, from the perspective of the pragmatic power elite, it doesn't really matter what's behind the mask just so long as the um, super state or the super government class, if you will, uh, controls the um, usage of that mask. Right. It becomes very pragmatic to them. Well, it, and I'm glad you bring that up, too, because with the uh, diminution and the significance of uh, religious ideas uh, uh, that is commensurate with the rise of secularism, that in turn was dignified by the Kantian rift. You have this view of religion uh, being essentially pragmatic, and from from uh, from uh, Saint Simone on uh, 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 the, the uh, enlightened theoretician Saint Simone on to his protege Auguste Comte, all the way to modern social scientists such as Williamson Bainbridge, who is also a techno progressive and has been studying uh, UFO cults and actually uh, promotes active experimentation with UFO cults and the development of a new religion. You have this idea of a uh, religion that is pragmatically sculpted along uh, socially and politically expedient conduits. As a matter of fact, I don't want to jump the con too much here. I, I know that we're going to... But if there's a body of evidence there pointing towards the abduction phenomenon being very much man-made, right. very much uh, something carried out and perpetrated by, by humans as opposed to otherworldly beings. And John Mack, who received considerable amounts of money from the Rockefeller dynasty to do his research into abductions, he saw abductees as new shamans that were leading uh, humanity uh, down a new spiritual path, basically reshaping humanity's spirituality. He said, he, he said, well, look, you know, I know that this is abusive. I know that the, the people don't like it. It's almost tantamount to rape. But ultimately, the abduction experience is a good one because people come away with a new, with a new vision of God and with a new, uh, a new spirituality. Right. So they're almost, these, these uh, uh, abductees are almost unwitting, unconscious, uh, uh, shaman, the carriers of the, yeah. of the new spirituality that that has been engineered by the by the power elite for purely pragmatic purposes, for for the purposes of of controlling humanity and uh, and uh, basically moving us away from from uh, anything that resembles Jeffersonian democracy and more towards uh, kind of uh, a society that that uh, really uh, resembles um, uh, uh, insect uh, communities a uh, high. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, uh, it's interesting, too. I don't want to get too far afield, but as you know, too, as you mentioned, uh, the social theorists, um, you know, sociology uh, and psychology also have a direct lineage out of... Um, particularly in the realms of education, uh, out of uh, Prussia and the Prussian model. And so we have a direct connection as well with, um, you know, Kant's idea of this sort of, uh, you know, the uh, enlightened despot, um, which is what Frederick of Prussia attempted to be uh, in the, uh, during 
you know, within that uh, Enlightenment period. And the whole idea, the whole Lipstick School, the Lipstick right. School of, of Psychology, yeah, and the ideas that informed Bill from Bunt's thinking, Bunt, they right. were transplanted here in the United States by uh, members of the uh, Skull and Bones, which is an elite uh, secret society that exists at, at Yale. Yes. And, uh, so you're you're absolutely right. It was those ideas were essentially uh, transplanted transplanted here and then they had a lot of their uh, source uh, the, a lot of their origin in, uh, in that whole Prussian militaristic yes. strict regimentation and it's and, and if I, I may make so bold I mean the, the uh, modern psychology and psych and psychiatry um, basically attempt to biologicize everything biologicize yes, right. uh, conscious and and, and provide nothing more than physiological origins for uh, behavior uh, that supplants the mental state with purely uh, biological and organic uh, functions. Uh, man is really nothing more than a, an animated piece of meat because every thought, feeling, and idea is a conditioned response to external stimuli. And this way of thinking can be traced all the way back to uh, uh, Saint Simone, um, uh, who uh, basically held that the hermeneutical keys to understanding uh, uh, human behavior lay in purely physiological realities, right. and he extrapolated that view into uh, the realm of political science, uh, this, this purely empirical view, um, and as a, re as a result, he developed the physiological or organic interpretation of the state, which views the, uh, the entirety of human society as nothing more than a massive organism. Yes. And that uh, same view informed the, uh, the views of none other than Ernest Tegel, who was uh, Adolf Hitler's mentor in social Darwinism. Right. And there we have the uh, uh, epistemological uh, foundations for uh, uh, scientific totalitarianism, this, this, this uh, purely empirical, uh, 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 this radical empiricism extrapolated into the realm of political science. And right. again, that all results from the Kantian rift, this bifurcation between phenomenon and noumenon, and basically rendering phenomenon as the only uh, knowable uh, thing there is, and that in turn is only rendered intelligible by the quantitative and uh, empirical methodologies proffered by the scientific materialists with the new ecclesiastical authority. That, yes. That um, whole way of thinking about uh, as far as psychology goes, which was really taking psyche out of psychology. It was taking the soul out of psychology yeah. uh, that was transplanted here in the United States by uh, by people who were uh, members of the Skull and Bones uh, Elite Society at Yale. Right, and it's, um, and it's a direct connection from there as well to the creation of um, entities like the American Psychological Association and right. the, uh, the British uh, Tavistock Institute, of course, setting up its um, branches here uh, for testing, and, and that's where we get into all the... Uh, you know, mind control type stuff. That well, I don't want to get too far afield, but that does re right. it does relate insofar as a lot of the um, history of mind control and Dr. Ewan Cameron and Jose Delgado and all those different characters uh, do play into a lot of uh, what we're going to see with the uh, so-called abductees and the UFO phenomenon. Absolutely. I, I was just going to make a few more uh, sure. connections there. I, I, I believe that, you know, that whole school of thinking is probably largely responsible for the proliferation of, of drugs that we see now, right. prescription drugs, because when humanity is reduced to a reactive animal, basically you can, you can control the, the direction that they take by simply flying them full of, uh, full of drugs, and, you know, and they, they, you, you see the commercials nowadays, and they, they, the commercials actually promote you going to a doctor asking for a prescription. 
you know, even though you and have no pharmacological knowledge or degree, you know, the common person, that's what, oh, let me define my pronoun there, the common person doesn't have any pharmacological knowledge, you know, to go and actually ask, you know, but they're actually promoting, you know, the idea of, of actually going and asking the doctor to give you a prescription so that you can be quite full of these. Uh, right. If we're, if I mean, if humans are just a bunch of chemical reactions, then it logically follows that the way to, quote, treat them or control would therefore be uh, just throwing more chemical reactions at them. Absolutely. Yeah, if it's all physiological, if it's all biochemical, if it's all anatomical, then it stands to reason that biochemical means of, uh, of uh, manipulating the individual can be used to mitigate the, the so-called, the, the, you know, the supposed the social ills uh, uh, that, that have perennially beset humanity, uh, criminality, and, and uh, 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 you know, turbulence. Yeah, I do. Turbulence. All these things can be mitigated by simply biochemically, uh, biochemically manipulating the purely physiological, biochemical, reactive animal that is man. That is the overall school of thought that 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 we're talking about. If and, yeah. and go ahead. In, in, in order to continue per perpetuating that myth, uh, uh, the the connection between a lot of these mass shootings and uh, the use of these of these uh, prescription medications has been ruthlessly suppressed. Right. They, they don't they do not want the causal connection between those two to to ever come out so that they can keep on narcotizing the uh, the population the way they are. The the the, the most, one of the most sinister outgrowths, however, of this from that school of thought uh, to me would be the diagnostic. Uh, Statistical manual DSM, which right. is now, and I, I can't, I can't even think of what edition it's in uh, now. It's, 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 been, it's gone through several different editions. Right. And, but you, you look at it, and uh, it, it criminalizes all, all these different, uh, different forms of dissent. It could easily be used to, uh, to criminalize uh, somebody who. Who uh, disagreed with the establishment? I think it was the fourth edition. Uh, I could be wrong. So don't, don't quote me on that. Just but in one, one particular edition, it actually qualified any and all spiritual outlook as being a form of this will. Right. And it even <laughs> it even still. Uh, I just uh, checked a few months ago. The latest edition still cites Dr. Ewan Cameron's uh, uh, article from Psychology Today from. I don't know, 50 or 60 years ago, that deals with mind-controlled alters. Uh, and again, I don't want to get into all the uh, MK Ultra stuff, but p the point being is that it, uh, even if, if a person might be skeptical of that kind of stuff, well, I mean, the establishment itself still cites it in its own uh, Bible of psychiatry. Absolutely, absolutely. But we're not getting too far afield by going to MK Ultra because... Uh, because that's going to lead us to an interesting character by the name of Colonel John Alexander as we get further into the discussion and everything. He, he said that the exposure of MK Ultra led to uh, the throwing out of the baby with the bathwater and that there can actually be uh, the positive, positive uh, 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 forms of, of mind control. And, uh, and yeah, we'll, uh, he, we'll... Well, so okay, so so here we go. Uh, how do we get from now? Okay, you've established, you made a good case here that that uh, the power elite see a usage for uh, this mask of the beyond that could be sort of tacked on to whatever it needs to terrorism, environmental disaster. Now, do we get to the juicy stuff? How does this fit into the you know alien UFO madness of the last? several decades and and which is just you know ev still everywhere in pop culture and i asked in my questions to you guys is this by design and is this predictive programming okay well is it predictive programming uh, predictive programming uh, in our view is, is one concept in conspiratorial research that is kind of in danger of falling into disrepute because the problem is is there's this ridiculously elastic criterion that some use to categorize certain 
films, books, and TV shows as predictive programming. I mean, all of a sudden, everything is uh, an innocuous right. episode of Gilligan's Island to <laughs> an inane garage sale sign can be classified as predictive programming. But nevertheless, one can hardly deny that certain films, TV programs, and books have had a normative impact on the dominant culture. Uh, artistic works within the genre of science fiction have been especially influential among audiences. Right. And thus, Paul and I now speak of what literary critic Martha A. Bar Barter, and that's a literary critic. That is not a conspiratorial theorist. Right. Martha A. Barter, Barter talks about uh, normative fiction. Normative fiction, it, it's not some incredibly sophisticated system of brainwashing, but instead, operating in a normative capacity, science fiction, it, it, it doesn't necessarily compel people to uh, behave contrary to their natures, because this perception of science fiction typically provides the tacit rationale for either propaganda or the explicit approval of censorship, but it is through the presentation of possibilities that the normative power of science fiction is most effectively demonstrated. If the possibilities presented by normative fiction are given serious socio-cultural currency, then they give rise to revisions in the status quo and the emergence of new cultural paradigms. Hypothetical scenarios of a normative nature can challenge the underlying assumptions of the current culture. Right. And of course, when one challenges the dominant outlook, the, domi the dominant dumping chunk, uh, one must pose a viable alternative, and to such an end, fiction, in particular nowadays in modernity, science fiction, can prescribe alternative values, principles, philosophies, and belting chunks. One of what's fiction starts making prescriptions, it becomes normative in character. By the way, those prescriptions are not already, always readily discernible because they are more so implicit within the narrative. But normative fiction exhibits this inherent ambiguity. It calls the status quo into question, but it simultaneously re reinforces some of the values of the dominant paradigm. Now, paradoxical though that may seem, normative fiction combines conformity and reality to create kind of a, a potent socio-cultural solvent. Uh, Martha A. Bar Barter explains it best. I'll, I'll quote her verbatim for the edification of your audience. She writes, quote, on the one hand, every fiction arises from a particular time and place and demonstrates to its hearers slash readers a tacit consensus regarding cultural norms. On the other hand, and at the same time, it can introduce to its readers possibilities that they previously did not know or had not considered and make these possibilities vividly real by fictional devices such as plot, character, setting, etc. Through the willing suspension of disbelief, readers conduct socio-cultural Gadonkin experiments. They test how such ideas might work out in reality and what effects they might produce and consider the possibility of a new consensus, unquote. Now, Gadonkin experiment, uh, to clarify, is the German word for thought experiment. The Gadonkin experiment involves the tangible enactment of hypothetical scenarios in hopes of re-sculpting reality and creating a new consensus. Basically, you float ideas, you test them, and uh, the underlying assumptions of the current culture are called into question as the socio-cultural thought experiment uh, progresses. It might give rise to revisions in the status quo and the emergence of, the emergence of new cultural paradigms. So the world of fact begins to more closely mirror the world of fiction. Right. The a priori assumptions of science fiction literature become the de facto precepts of culture itself, and in this sense, fiction becomes a precursor to fact. Uh, the famous science fiction writer and editor John W. Campbell, I believe he wrote The Thing from Outer Space, uh, uh, which of course uh, later on became the... Uh, the blockbuster uh, feature film and uh, was even remade by uh, director John Carpenter. 
uh, he proposed that science fiction presented in his own words, quote, an unparalleled opportunity for sociocultural thought experiments, unquote. So as such, some science fiction can inspire tectonic shifts in society and culture, and the nature of those shifts depends upon the nature of the normative statements that inspired them. For instance, uh, the techno-utopian premises of a lot of science fiction out there, I don't want to draw a gross overgeneralization, but there is a lot of science fiction right. that has this techno-utopian undercurrent. That can be somewhat troubling, especially in light of the questionable outcomes of most socio-political utopian movements, such as communism, fascism, and other forms of uh, socialism. It is possible that some science fiction can spread ideational contagions, what, you know, Fyodor Dostoevsky would have called a fire in the minds of men. It can become a revolutionary faith that's premised upon the myth, and that myth is neither a tra traditional nor transcendent one. It is a vision that the myth-maker hopes will witness tangible enactment through the blind activism of adherence. And in this sense, the myths conjured up by the socio-political utopians of history and the techno-utopian prophets of science, science fiction qualify as Sorelian myths. Uh, the Sorelian conception of myths is really quite different from the traditional and transcendent conception of myths. Uh, Sorelian myths are essentially social myths. Uh, a social myth, as conceived by uh, George Sorel, uh, conjures up an image of a potential future within the minds of those who are exposed to them. And in many instances, such as the cases of Marxism and other variants of socialism, the image evoked by the social myth is utopian in character, and this shared vision gains imaginative momentum amongst the true believers and eventually witnesses instantiation through political or social uh, activism. Uh, uh, but well, oh, sorry, no, a, a, a perfect uh, incarnation of what you're describing would be H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells, himself a socialist, of course, uh, sort of the prophet of Fabian socialist uh, technocracy, uh, the shape of things to come, the New World Order, uh, presents the very thing you're talking about, uh, a utopian, socialistic, technocratic future where all races, creeds, and uh, uh, differences have been overcome. And basically we have the, you know, the Federation of Star Trek where everything is... Right. Is, right. Uh, and, and, and with H.G. Wells, an interesting thing that Martha A. Barner states about H.G. Wells, and I don't want to go too far afield here, but in her, in her essay, which, by the way, for the edification of the audience, is simply titled uh, Normative fiction, and I would recommend that they all read that, that. This is a literary critic, not a conspiratorial theorist. Right. She says that uh, Leo Zillard uh, was, uh, his views were informed by H.G. Wells' The World Set a Fire, and that uh, gave rise to the Manhattan Project, which of course led to the creation of the atom bomb. And the term atom bomb, that appellation was coined by H.G. Wells, not by Leo, Leo Zillard. I did not and know that. Out of this, uh, uh, this cult of the super weapon, right? Um, um, that we uh, suddenly have several different models of, of global government, whether it be uh, the Pax Universalis, which is a multilateral form of global governance, or a, a Pax Americana, uh, a unilaterally initiated form of global governance. You have a sectarian dispute within. Uh, the cult of the super weapon between those two, but right. invariably the, the same theme is, is, is uh, resident within both views, and that is this notion of global governance, uh, which is enforced uh, at the point of uh, the, at the point of a, of a gun, that being the super weapon. The super weapon becomes the proverbial rod of correction, you know, the agent of coercion, yeah, to be used upon recalcitrant nations and this in a lot of the uh, nuclear anxiety fiction where right. typically the enemy was Asiatic. And yes. so there's this, this, this uh, racist undercurrent to, uh, to it. In fact, uh, uh, President Truman was uh, heavily uh, influenced by a great deal of that fiction. And you're going to see the rise 
above the cult of the, it, um, this new UFO-based spirituality and the rise of the cult of the super weapon in one, in one book. And that would be Bernard Newman's book, uh, the, uh, the Flying Saucer. Both, both are going to rise. Both this, of those thematic threads are going to rise out of that book. This is interesting because I, 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 being a fan of science fiction, I'd never heard of this work. So um, I was glad that you guys brought it up. Tell us about The Flying Saucer. Okay. Bernard Newman's work, The Flying Saucer, really provided us with the earliest evidence of a possible plan to use a false alien uh, invasion as a pretext for world government. Uh, we, we interpret this important work as that plan, that, that long-range plan of the elites for world government in embryo. This was its embryonic stage right. as far as we're concerned. That's and it's important to it. point out, this is a fiction work. Um, uh, but like uh, like a lot of a lot of fiction, you you have fact couched in it, uh, it. Basically, presenting things in a fictional context sometimes makes it easier to digest. Yeah, well, uh, as as Martha a martyr, uh, and I, I apologize for repeating myself. As she puts it, the building suspension of disbelief, uh, the, the, the the all the elements of fiction character, plot, uh, what have you, all of them make uh, more palatable uh, uh, these, these, uh, hypo these hypothetical scenarios, and that's what gives rise to the sociocultural Duncan experiment, the sociocultural thought experiment, the, the ideas, uh, fantastical and perhaps even untenable, though they may be, become more so attractive and become uh, more so, uh, more so feasible uh, when they are couched in the context of fiction. So, so you can essentially construct a narrative in it, in it within the context of entertainment initially, and then later see that very same narrative emerge in in reality. Yeah, uh, my my own uh, uh, research in my now defunct master's thesis on James Bond. And Ian Fleming demonstrated all of what you're talking about, although it didn't necessarily um, deal with uh, the same subject matter as what you're uh, d describing in terms, of, in terms of science fiction. In a way, it did, insofar as most of that was set during the Cold War, and all of the same uh, tactics, or what you might call... Uh, Propaganda, I guess, would be the best way to put it, is being utilized. In other words, Bond, you know, becomes this emblematic figure of uh, the Anglo-American Empire, who stands up for, uh, you know, during the Cold War, capitalism and freedom, uh, as opposed to the um, Eastern forces of collectivism, communism, Sovietism, et cetera, et cetera. But it's all the same type of methodology. In other words. Uh, for example, Fleming would utilize um, the tactic of painting the very thing that MI6 was doing as the thing that the enemies were doing. And we see this even, right. even now in the Bond films where all of the surveillance and spying that, uh, for example, in Skyfall, that Bond is fighting with um, Javier Bardem's uh, sort of uh, rogue uh, uh, Julian Assange type Edward Snowden character who's on the run uh, uh, as some sort of uh, mad tech genius um, and Bond is there of course to uh, save the day and, and you know when in fact it's actually quite the opposite it's the establishment that does most of that work. Absolutely and um, it's interesting John Le Carre uh, not like Fleming and, right. You know, Jean Le Carre, Le Carre uh, is another writer of espionage, of intelligence novels, and, and he referred to, to it as, uh, referred to the Bond series and to Fleming's uh, writings over Bond as, quote-unquote, cultural pornography, <laughs> because that's how reprehensible he 
found the tactics and methods employed by this kind of misogynistic, uh, 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 morally inept uh, uh, character. That's how we, that's how we viewed those uh, the, the, the guy's methods. And if I may, if I may add, um, um, that perhaps this is this is perhaps an, an interpretation that I'm imposing upon. Uh, um, I think it might be a salient observation. If, we, if you notice, Bond is excused from all functions to be moral by virtue of the fact that he is a cold warrior. The cold war was, of course, marked by a distinctly Manichaean character. Yep. Um, the powers of light and darkness, east and west, uh, the evil empire, the, uh, benevolent, the benevolent democratic uh, 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 west, United States and, and uh, uh, Britain, and um, it, it, within that, that Manichaean binary opposition, um, where uh, you can find you can find real, really uh, no, you can find really no compromise between either either side. Um, Bond becomes the, the the veritable white knight. Uh, uh, this this. Uh, 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 this basically this this this, this uh, white knight that uh, enjoys a kind of agnostic self righteous exceptionalism uh, one of one of one of the elect who, yes who's the, 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 they're, they're not they're not subjected to the, the scrutiny of uh, the the typical uh, 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 moral compass of man and, and they're they're viewed as essentially uh, necessary, um, kind of like the way that Bane puts it in the Dark Knight Rises. Yes, I am necessary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, bon, bon, Bond refers to himself in Casino Royale as um, sort of beyond the dialectic of good and evil. He's a he's an, right. a Nietzschean Ubermensch, and he even ruminates in Casino Royale, the novel, that he is engaged in a Manichaean struggle, but that ultimately it doesn't really matter what side you fall down on uh, because good and evil are simply relative to whichever side you choose. Right. And again, he's excused from all that he's doing. He's excused of those sins because he is thwarting the attempt of the, these attempts at world domination committed and perpetrated solely by the quote-unquote rogues. But as you pointed out, all the, all the practices and plots that the ropes uh, employ and hatch in those stories uh, in, the, in the in Fleming fiction are, are identical to ones that the establishment has had. <laughs> exactly. The very, the, you know, we, we see those same kind of uh, those same kind of uh, plots hatched within the halls of MI6, within the halls of CIA. I, I remember in Quantum of Solace where they're um, Basically, planning uh, planning a uh, a coup in this country. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't recall the particular country that that the coup was supposed to take place in. But tell me how that's any different than what the CIA did with the overthrow of Allende in Chile or Mohammed Mossadegh in in um, in Iran. And after him, they, they after after his. After they overthrew him and installed the Shah, and the Shah became expendable, then they overthrew the Shah and, and right. threw the peacock throne with their Muslim Brotherhood cohort towards hearts. It's the exact same thing. Bond is trying to thwart the exact same things that 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 MI6 and MI MI6 and CIA and CIA does on almost a regular on almost a regular basis. Because it's a bad thing when it's done by the road. And it's interesting that this all emerges from the British cultural milieu. Right. Because it was within that cultural milieu, milieu that we see uh, the uh, Elizabethans under the influence of uh, mystics like Dorji and uh, 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 British Freemasonry and what have you. And um, you also have uh, uh, the works of Spencer. In particular, Spencer's right. poem, The Fairy Queen, right. um, which, according to uh, Dave Gates, uh, should be read as a poetic metaphor uh, it, um, it, for uh, the uh, white magic of pure imperial reform right. um, that's imposed upon the 
people the diplomacy of the uh, enemy. So it's out of that cultural milieu you see this Gnostic, self-righteous, exceptionalism arise. And that, of course, would also uh, lead, lead to the great game between uh, Britain and, uh, and, and Russia for right. control of Eurasia. And, and depending on which side you fell, fell on, uh, the, the other one side was black magic and the other side was white magic. Right. Um, it, it, but um, at, at, at our discussion of Bernard Newman and his book, The Flying Saucer, believe, believe it or not, does go into the topic of M. Fleming and M. Fleming's 007 character a little bit. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just, you know, proceed with, you know, with, uh, with the rest of you know, with, with a little synopsis of, of, of the flying saucer. Uh, uh, again, it, that, that book seems to have been the plan for world government in its embryonic stages. It may, in fact, be the first time that such a plan was presented to the semi-submerged, self-replicating global oligarchical establishment that has long expressed a desire to see the emergence of, of, of a system of global management. Um, Newman published that book in 1948, and according to the, um, the author, uh, uh, Mark Pilkington, who's written an excellent book entitled Mirage Man, Mirage Men, and I, I would really encourage the audience to find a copy of that book and read it. Um, according to him, the book, quote, has had the singular distinction of being the world's first UFO book, unquote. Now, the book presents readers with this conspiratorial cabal of scientists from across the world that possesses that all-too-familiar goal of ending war and establishing utopia. And in order to, re to realize their globalist dream of a united planet, the scientists manufacture a threat from space. And the scientists in that book bear er eerie resemblance to the, uh, to the technical decision makers envisioned by Howard Scott. And Howard Scott was the founder of the technocracy movement here in the United States. In 1932, Scott joined forces with none other than Marion uh, King Hubert, M.K. King Hubert, the individual who created the uh, peak oil theory. And uh, the two of them started Technocracy Incorporated, which is a group that believed that traditional political institutions should be jettisoned in favor of a supposedly rational and apolitical a group of engineers who would steer the economy and society. And while back, while back, this concept was in direct opposition to the principles of Jeffersonian democracy, the movement did experience some success for several years. It, it had a membership roster that swelled to about 500,000 members at one time. And several elite retainers and operatives have written in support of the concept. The big name Brzezinski, the former national security advisor to Carter, the founder of the elitist trilateral commission and a retainer for the Rockefeller dynasty is a prime example. The concept of a technotronic era, which Brzezinski presents in his work between two ages is nearly identical to many of the ideas and concepts that were presented by the early technocracy movement. Excellent. And if I may also add, uh, um, I believe Jacques Fresco, the uh, futurist, um, who really inspired the uh, Zeitgeist films, right. present um, uh, uh, an amalgam of technocratic ideas uh, and uh, theosophical uh, spirituality. Uh, Jacques Fresco uh, was also a member of Technocracy Incorporated. Interesting. Uh, he later on supposedly repudiated um, his. Uh, technocratic heritage, but nonetheless, technocratic ideas remain firmly embedded within the uh, societal vision that he advances through the Venus Project. Yeah. So, so there's this, techno this, this uh, technocratic thread running through, through uh, Newman's book, The Flying Saucer, and that suggests to us that he was writing, that he was writing a prescription to the elite, and not just some science fiction story that was meant to entertain Joe and Susie Lunchbox. Um, in, in order to achieve their goals of world unity, uh, in the book, the ca this cabal of scientists decided that the world must become quote unquote universe conscious. Yeah. Now, how do you do this? How, how do you change man's thinking so that it transcends 
not only national boundaries, but the very planet itself, the very limits of the planet. Uh, the scientists in the book decide that an alien invasion, hostile otherworldly creatures, would provide the best pre pretext for the kind of social engineering, engineering project they have in mind. And in the book, uh, Newman uh, even cites a very real speech made by uh, British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden at a United Nations conf conference on the 1st of March in 1947. And in that speech, Eden expressed the concern uh, over the possibility that humanity was going to somehow destroy the Earth and itself. And um, he, he also made a very peculiar statement during the speech. He suggested that an alien invasion might provide humanity with the motivation it needed to prevent some kind of man, uh, man-made, human-manufactured Armageddon. He said, quote, Sometimes I think the people of this distracted planet will never really get together until they find someone in Mars to get mad against, unquote. Uh, so he was saying, you know, basically we had to get damn angry at some bloody Martians, you know, uh, in, order to, in order to come together and, and stop being distracted by uh, all these petty right. differences. And, you know, it, it also looks like the cosmological mythology of uh, alien invaders or alien uh, attackers, aggressors, has the, uh, it's, it conveniently uh, can sort of subsume all the other um, threats, the masks that you mentioned earlier. I mean, in other words, the aliens can now become the terrorists. The aliens are, are going to terrorize us because of our uh, lack of environmental, you know, climate change concern, uh, and it will also ena enable us to um, come together religiously. So, in other words, all the different uh, lies can be subsumed under this cosmological uh, threat. Exactly. Exactly. The, the, the aliens possess all these humanal qualities that outstrip the world of international relations and of conventional, traditional politics. Those, those numinal qualities, uh, uh, the, the unknowable qualities, uh, can only be rendered intelligible through the scientific method of a, uh, of a technocratic circle of policy professionals, of uh, a scientific elite, a scientific technological elite, um, and those, those, uh, those numinal qualities, the beyond, stipulate the imposition of a managerial model upon society that is completely, totally inimical to uh, democracy. Uh, the democracy must be jettisoned. Um, um, representative government must be jettisoned. Uh, all of this must be jettisoned in order to face the beyond that besets man. But you're absolutely right that it subsumes the other threats. Um, if you'll remember the... Uh, the movie that had Charlie Sheen in it, uh, uh, The Arrival. Yes. Uh, in that, in that, the aliens were actually causing climate change, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> changing the planet uh, so that it was so that its uh, environment was more was identical to theirs. It was just a terraforming operation. Yeah, yeah, and 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 then of, um, there's been several movies where the aliens when they were rationalizing their subjugation of the planet, they said, well, we have a right to do this. You abdicate, you abdicated your right to the planet by polluting Mother Earth, by polluting <laughs> its streams, its rivers, its oceans, and, you know, and, uh, and uh, so, it, it, and strip mining and all the, and tearing down the rainforest, so now you have no right to the planet, we now have a right, <laughs> and, the, and the characters in that narrative, the protagonists in that narrative, almost always have the, always end up saying, well, gee, they're evil, the aliens are evil, we have to, we have to uh, force them off the planet, we have to take back the planet, but damn it, you know, they, they actually have a point there, they, they have to begrudge you to concede at that point. Uh, uh, another in, uh, another uh, uh, example would be the uh, director's cut of J James Cameron's The Abyss, which basically constitutes an abandoned parousia, uh, where these, these ethereal uh, beings uh, that uh, 
uh, are essentially extraterrestrials, uh, uh, but they're, they're, they're are, uh, viewed and depicted almost as being deities themselves, um, with, with uh, the ability to manipulate water and manipulate uh, uh, matter. Um, they come to Earth and they basically pass judgment on the human race. Yeah, and then Ed Harris's character stands there as kind of like the lawyer for all of humanity, saying, wait, give us a second chance. Right. Don't flood the planet just yet. Don't wipe us out. And I might add that, that this, 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 this is, is ironic because this is the very same sort of behavior that the new atheists and uh, many of the critics of traditional theism and the uh, uh, milieu of modernity criticize the anthropomorphic god of uh Christianity and of uh, the monotheistic faiths for. Uh, right. Well, on what grounds does he judge us? Well, you know, the, on what grounds do these alien beings uh, uh, pass judgment on us? If the, same, if the same criteria holds sway, then one could call into question uh, uh, the uh, one could call into question the judgment uh, by an alien race, just as much as one could call into question judgment by an alien. But it's but it's not a it's not a question of logic and reason. It's just a question of tricks. It's a question of pulling a psychological. It's like a con man. I mean, it's a con man comes and when you when you're checking someone out at the register and he uh, confuses you with a bunch of different twenty dollar bills and says, "Oh, you owe me a twenty dollar bill." It's just a trick. Exactly. Exactly. And guilt seems to play a great. Right. Seems to be a major element in the con. Exactly. And Returning to that statement that made by Anthony Eden, we can't help but wonder if Eden was expressing sentiments that had been circulated in elite circles, in, a, in different elitist circles at right. the time. Um, it's interesting to note that Eden was friends with Ian and Anne Fleming, uh, going back, you know, to to uh, to Ian Fleming, the uh, creator of James Bond 007. That character was based on a very real person. It was William Stevenson, the uh, senior representative of British intelligence, who was known by the code name Intrepid during World War II. And uh, I believe he was the one that was actually uh, very instrumental in the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency in the post-war world. And uh, basically... Uh, um, fashioned it uh, along the lines of the special operations executive in, uh, in, in England. Um, but while there is a lot of sensational elements in those Bond stories that are meant to make them a lot more lively and interesting and to jazz them up, uh, there is also uh, several elements of truth. Right. One of the most interesting elements for us was a group that Bond periodically did battle with that was known as the Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Revolution, and Espionage, right. also referred to by the acronym SPECTRE. SPECTRE was a large uh, conspiratorial infrastructure that transcended national boundaries uh, and was not anchored to any one given ideology. It, it, it could not be identified with one of the two major superpowers. Right. Instead, instead, it, it would actually pit the East and the West, America and the Soviet Union, off of one another right. in a process that resembled the dialectical process suggested by the philosopher, uh, the philosopher Georg, uh, George uh, Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. So we can't help but wonder if Fleming Specter was based on the very real uh, global oligarchical establishment that that infer uh, that informal fraternity of, of of power holders that is manipulating social changes from the margins. Um, the the scientists that are in Newman's uh, novel they stage a series of events right. involving extraterrestrial spacecraft crashing in different locations around the world, and one of those crashes, interestingly enough, occurs in New Mexico, bringing to mind probably the most famous of UFO incidents, the Roswell crash. Um, the New Mexico crash in Newman's novel is very similar to that alleged Roswell crash. Witnesses to the Roswell crash allege that strange 
these hieroglyphics were discovered on the wreckage, and the crashed craft in Newman's novel also processes hieroglyphics. And in Newman's book, uh, the strange hieroglyphics are deciphered, revealing that the craft's occupants are of hostile uh, invaders from Mars, and uh, the cabal of scientists proceed then after, after this revelation to absolutely just traumatize the Earth's population. There's a missile attack that they, that they conduct on, on a forest. It's an uninhabited forest, but they just devastate it, wipe it out. It's attributed to the, to the aliens, kind of, <laughs> kind of like a Bay of Tonkin, a cosmic Bay of Tonkin. Kind of, I'm sorry, not Bay of Tonkin, Gulf of Tonkin, the, the, kind of like a, a Gulf of Tonkin incident, a, a cosmic Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, Gulf of Tonkin, of course, being a false flag operation that uh, escalated America's military involvement in uh, in Vietnam. Um, they, they they also uh, stage uh, a crash where um, where bodies of dead aliens. Are discovered, and, right. and, and the aliens are really nothing more than anthropomorphic facsimiles that are made from animal cadavers. Mm -hmm. um, the social engineering project really reaches its crescendo with the landing of alien craft all over the planet, and this landing is, it prompts the Soviet Union and the and America to merge. Such a merger is, of course, a very real long-term goal right. of of the power elite. And in Bernard's novel, nuclear weapons are also distributed to all the na other nations of the Earth. So there is also that thematic thread uh, leading to the cult of the super weapon. Um, because it, it's interesting to note that both proliferation and counter proliferation campaigns have been used by the elite as a pretext for world government. Uh, AQ Khan. Uh, prior to AQ Khan, the passing of, nu of nuclear secrets through the Great Falls uh, uh, air, air Base, where uh, Major George Racy Jordan found out that this was going on under the uh, under the uh, uh, pretext of the Lend Lease Act. Um, but anyways, Newman's novel, according to Pilkington, quote, seems deliberately to merge fiction and fact, unquote. Newman may have uh, become privy to actual plans within elitist and intelligence circles to create an alien menace during his work with the British Ministry of Information, or MOI. And that was basically the central government department responsible for the, uh, for the creation and distribution of propaganda during the Second World War. It was located in the Senate House at the University of London back in those days. Interesting. It, it supposedly acted as the model for the Ministry of Truth, Oceania's propaganda ministry, right. in George Orwell's dystopian novel, wow. 1984. And uh, we... we uh, Cite uh, the research of an independent uh, researcher named Jackie Jura. She uh, uh, she um, claims that Orwell's wife Eileen uh, worked at the Ministry of Information in the censorship department from 1939 to 1942, and she asserts that the M O I was actually responsible for preventing Orwell's book from being published during the war. Uh, due to its strong anti-communist and strong anti-Stalinist message. Uh, at the time, the MOI was spreading very pro-Soviet propaganda right. Right. so that the British uh, population would view Stalin as, as an ally uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, cause of sto uh, as Fashion, stopping the right. Axis powers. I got it. So, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, well, so... Uh, I don't mean to, to interrupt, but um, oh, if, if we could, I'd like to transition to the next question. Where uh, I'm gonna, I want I want you to explain what what we start to notice then, since since we see that this is a fiction work that clearly has parallels to a lot of um, you know real events. When we look at things like uh, Childhoods End by Arthur Clarke. You know, other famous science fiction novels, we start to see the same pattern. We start to see that uh, there's the imminent threat, the governments come together, scientists are involved in solving the threat, uh, world government's the only solution. 
So what we start seeing, the pattern we start noticing is that there are clearly human elements all throughout all this, right? Right. And so right. the common thread appears to be these human elements, especially when we look at abduction cases. Now, you guys go into depth into uh, some abduction cases and the so-called men in black. Uh, so what I want to ask you is, do we see, uh, is this a key indicator, uh, these human elements, to grasping the phenomenon, and do we, off, do we not often see uh, elements of the psychological establishment at work here, too? A absolutely. We, we do see elements of the psychological uh, uh, um, establishment and the uh, intelligence community at work in, 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 in this, uh, you know, in the creation and the manufacturing of this hoax. One, uh, the, the, the Betty and Barney Hill case is, is where we see, uh, we see a lot of this. Of course, you know, Betty and Barney Hill... Uh, were, were driving through Groverton. They saw strange lights. They got scared. They drove away. Uh, but but uh, as time went on, they began to experience very, very uh, traumatic um, um, uh, you know, residual effects, kind of uh, nightmares. And, and that led to them seeking out help. Uh, and a hypno a hypno a hypnosis was employed to reconstruct the uh, the narrative, uh, and, and uh, this this wild narrative of of, of an alien abduction ta uh, taking place uh, came to be constructed uh, as a result of all that. Um, but uh, but if you look at at their at at the uh, at what came out of those. Uh, sessions, those uh, hypnotic regression se uh, sessions, and you see that parts of the Hill's account imply human interference. Right. Betty described their, abduct their abductors as men who were, quote, human in form, unquote. Betty remembered the UFO uh, occupants being, quote, five feet to five feet, four inches in stature, with large chest have prominent Jimmy Durante noses, unquote. Uh, and also, she also recalled the creatures having ha hair and eyes that were black and skin with a, with a grayish hue. And while some of these features are bizarre, the UFO uh, occupants still possess this anthropoid, these anthropoid uh, features. And um, Betty's nightmares... Uh, according to uh, Stan Friedman in in the uh, book captured in the book captured uh, that he wrote uh, with the, with the co-author, um, the, the, her nightmares quote contain details of being stopped and surrounded by spe by with, by uh, space people with primarily human characteristics unquote. Uh, the clothing worn by the men in uh, Betty's nightmare also suggested human abductors as opposed to aliens. Um, Friedman and uh, Martin, they write, quote, all of the men were dressed alike in navy blue gray trousers and short jackets that gave the appearance of having zippers. Well, if it had the appearance, then it more than of zippers, and more than likely was zippers. But they're, they space, zip, they're space zippers. They're not normal zippers. <laughs> they're space zippers. <laughs> yeah, don't you know space zippers are different than normal zippers? <laughs> Also, they wore military caps. They wore rubber boots. Uh, Betty's nightmare, in Betty's nightmare, only one abductor spoke and communicated with her in, in English. It was a heavy, there was a heavy foreign accent to the English, but it was English nonetheless. Like Betty, Barney described aliens that were strikingly human in, in appearance, behavior, and attire. Um, um, it, it, the, the, according to Barney, they were human in form, and they were dressed in shiny black uniforms. They had black caps with peaks or bills on them. Uh, and and he, Barney even, the most stunning thing was that he drew a comparison between his abductors and the Nazis. Uh, he, he, um, Barney uh, said that he encountered a man in a shiny black jacket with a threatening sp uh, stare that reminded him of a Nazi. Uh, and... and 
the Nazis, they were certainly inhumane, but they were very much human. And so I, all throughout this, you detect, you detect the, yeah. the perpetrators of this abduction, you detect their humanity. And, and so, and, 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 and so, you know, there's, there's an example of some of the, uh, some of the, the evidence that's overlooked or just suppressed that suggests that this is a terrestrial based uh, phenomenon. That right. This is, that this was created by, uh, by, by humans, that was manufactured by, by forces terrestrial in nature as opposed to otherworldly. And, and I should also, I should also uh, point out Barney Hill was friends with Major James McDonald, who was a retired Air Force intelligence officer at Peace Air Force Base. And while he was retired at the time of their friendship, he was working as a consultant to the Air Force. Mm -hmm. McDonald was the first individual to convince the Hills to undergo hypnotic regression. Right. And, you know, we, we just couldn't help but wonder when we were studying this, why, why would McDonald suggest such a questionable method uh, to the Hills? Yeah as a means of finding out what happened to them when, when they were making that trip through Groverton. Why, why is it that the UFOs just always happen to have the technology that's the cutting-edge technology of the military? <laughs> In other words, exactly. in other words, they have these you know electromagnetic weapons that apparently appear to be able to shut down other electronics within the area. They have, uh, you know... Basically, all all the the same types of uh, problems that we might encounter with uh, known uh, present day military, uh, for example, the Roswell crash. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, did the aliens came the, the aliens came all this way and uh, they didn't have enough gas? I mean, you know, yeah, exactly. it's just, exactly. Or they, you know, the, or or uh, or the what one thing that has been uh, suggested was that the horrible storm that had happened the night of the crash had somehow uh, disabled their their vehicle or caused the uh, caused, rendered the computers inoperable. <laughs> it, it, well, you can survive the the radiation of the Van Allen belt in here, but somehow, like a little you know uh, seasonal thunderstorm is going to just totally, uh, you know, rain on your parade. It's going yeah. to just totally ruin your game. That, it's just strange, it's strange credulity, all the hell. So that brings us to the next uh, piece of evidence that calls into question this phenomenon, at least for me. Uh, when we begin to look at entities like MUFON and NICAP and all of the dubious characters involved in these groups, uh, if, if, if a person has read uh, just a little bit of um, books that deal with intelligence agencies and things like that, which I would consider myself a novice in that topic, but I've read enough of those, of those works to start to see that, well, you know, these groups, MUFON, NICAP, et cetera, et cetera, they begin to take on all the same characteristics and patterns of other entities that are basically tools. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you look at the work of the late Todd Zeckel, a researcher who claimed to be a former employee of the Army Security Services, which, which was the forerunner to the NSA, the National Security Agency, um, he, he, uh, he um, pointed out that, uh, that NICAP was, was infiltrated by, uh, by members of the intelligence community. Uh, he, he said that a number of CIA covert operatives uh, were in key positions in NICAP. Uh, Count Nicholas de, Roch, de, Rock, de Rockford, who is now dead, had been a member of, of the CIA's uh, psychological warfare s staff, and he had become the vice chairman of NICAP in, in its foundational year, 1956. Bernard uh, J. Uh, Carvalho, who, who was the, uh, who was basically a, a kind of liaison between uh, uh, between companies that were, were fronts for the CIA. Um, uh, he was appointed chairman of NICAP's membership subcommittee, and uh, he 
he was on that for a period of time. Um, a CIA briefing officer, uh, Carl Flock, when he left the CIA, he eventually became the chairman of NICAP's Washington, D.C. subcommittee, uh, according according to Zeckel. Um, and, and so um, it, it, you, you see these these several uh, different uh, different uh, infiltrators within within NICAP's rank ranks, uh, and um, they used their positions to do to the, the, their their infiltration into these key positions to do several different things. Um, uh, one of the things that they that they did. Um, was was push uh, push uh, Donald uh, Kehoe, who was an American Marine Corps naval aviator who co-founded NICAP out of the organization, and um, they also uh, pushed uh, they also uh, pushed out um, uh, John L a- John L Acuff, and then um, and even and even Acuff. Uh, had strong CIA ties, but they, when he was when he was out, they replaced him with Alan N. Hall, who was uh, another individual that Zeckel alleged to be a CIA agent. And uh, and uh, it, the, the 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 reason for this was basically to control the consensus in these groups, in in our opinion. To uh, to uh, make sure that when investigations were 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 conducted, that the interpretational lens right. that they saw these things through uh, was skewed. Right. Um, it, it, the evidence would never be interpreted as anything other than otherworldly, uh, than extraterrestrial, and those quote unquote inconvenient truths. You know those. Men with, uh, little gray men with built caps and all, speaking in English accents right. and all, would be pushed out, would be ignored, would be ignored and, su- and suppressed. And um, he, the, the, you know, um, there, there, there are good people that came from the Central Intelligence Agency that would say that this is complete bunk. But you have to remember that the compartmentalization of the intelligence community generally, and the CIA specifically supports the idea that these things are going on, and that the more benign uh, and uh, the more benign uh, portions of the intelligence community, the more benign uh, portions of the agency made up of noble and good people who are actually just doing their job would have no idea that this was going right. on. Not everybody, not everybody's working in PSYOPs and Black Ops. Exactly. I, the irony of it is, is that the Central Intelligence Agency lacks any centrality. From its very inception, the agency was a victim of powerful forces that wanted to cultivate this kind of environment yeah. where both the right hand and the left hands just don't know what the hell each other were doing. And as a result, uh, the agency became kind of a, a collection of really what could be described as intelligence fiefdoms. Uh, rife with uh, with factionalism, uh, so it, it, these these projects, you know, with with were, were were probably going on and still going on to this very day without the uh, without the the majority of, of agency employees knowing that it's even it's even taking. Place. Yeah, in other words, uh, Robert Baer might not know about what's happening with you know Mufon. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's exactly. A, he's assigned overseas doing some other thing. Exactly, exactly. Well, he, 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 some of his work might even play a role in the deception, but, um, but he's fed an, uh, a cover story, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that the work that, he, he, uh, that he's doing uh, is ostensibly for purpose A, when in fact it's being used uh, for, purpose, for purpose B. And that reminds me of uh, a book that you, that I got into that you guys mentioned a while back was uh, Victor Marchetti's book, um, CIA and the Cult of Intelligence. And there is a uh, a key <coughs> a key section that uh, I I came across, and then you read my mind when I uh, I was in a discussion with uh, I believe Philip, 
where he talks about the creation of a sort of vampire cult that was uh, needed for uh, whatever purpose. Uh, I don't remember if it was Bolivia or Peru or somewhere where the local uh, the locals. It was, it was a Central or South American country, like right. you say. It was, that was the target population. And uh, it was it was useful for. Uh, you know, whatever the purpose happened to be at that time, to create this sort of superstitious uh, spin on the religion, utilize it uh, that involved vampires. But so, in other words, this is not far flung or far fetched. I mean, this is just like like we've been saying all along. It's the usage of the beyond. Absolutely, absolutely, and it was that was the employment of the beyond right there. Because what drove what. What dwarfs man epistemologically more than a creature of the night that, that drinks human blood? <laughs> <laughs> it cannot be killed uh, by, by any human me- means short of, short of sunlight. An alien who, uh, the only thing that Trump said is an alien who does it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, but yeah, I mean, we, we have the exact same thing going on. Thematically, it's, it's, the, it's the same. So... Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask this because right after I had asked you guys about doing this interview, um, I, I was did an analysis of ET, and I came across um, some good information on uh, the Orson Welles situation. So I know this is kind of rewinding in the course of our conversation, but I wanted to get you guys' take on the uh, War of the Worlds, War of the Worlds. Uh, radio debacle with Orson Welles. What's your guys' analysis of that? There was a book that came out called Invaders from Mars, and it was compiled and edited by an individual named Hadley Cantrell. Right. Uh, it's basically a collection of essays by a study group that was funded by the Rockefellers to study the effects that that broadcast had on... on um, on the population, and um, the, their findings were quite interesting because they found that those who were most affected by it, the, those who were most affected by or- Orson Welles' uh, broadcast of War of the Worlds, were uh, the, the, those people that fell within what we would classify as as the Bible Belt, um, which is. Uh, it, 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 it's made, the, the Bible Belt is made up of, of, of good people, but it's also laced with a lot of, of, of religious superstition, for lack of a better term. Um, it's it's uh, heavily credulous. Heavily credulous. That's just not true. I'm from the Bible Belt, and that is just completely not true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Obviously, that's true. I, I know it better than anybody being from the Bible Belt. So, yes. Right. Yeah. Well, well uh, uh, a hallmark of, of, of fundamentalism uh, tends to be uh, media. Absolutely. Uh, which again, yeah, which again was engendered by the Kantian rift, this uh, uh, divorce between reason and faith, where, where, um, where traditional uh, Orthodox theology views the two as complementary, uh, the, uh, the, the fundamentalist really captures and an intractable binary opposition. Right. Uh, they really view uh, reason more, more or less as the uh, enemy of faith, right. which, of course, uh, is not really so, especially when you uh, look at the etymology of faith. It's from the uh, Greek word, the word pieces, which is, uh, a re- was also used as a rhetorical term by uh, Aristotle and Quintilius to uh, connote uh, ev- uh, uh, forensic uh, it, it, faith is evidentiary in character. They, faith requires evidence. The allocation of confidence or faith is completely and totally contingent upon the guidance of reason. So they both work hand in hand and uh, it, it, it complementing each other. But with, in, in, in fundamentalism, there is, a, there is this uh, pervasive anti-intellectualism uh, that uh, views a lack of education as being to uh, someone's credit, and the more that uh, a person knows, uh, the, the more they are, quote unquote, in sin, they have a pumped up, uh, sure. pumped up fleshy mind. Uh, I, I've, I've heard it all before, and it's been directed at the, 
such criticisms have been directed at me, to which all I can reply is that um, God didn't give us uh, the use of our brains to forego, um, to forego it to you. So, um, you know, but at any rate, that, that, that mediaism uh, contributed in part to uh, the credulity of the, uh, of the Bible Belt and the susceptibility to manipulation uh, via the War of the World's uh, broadcast. The, the elite seem to have taken note of that credulity and the ability of that population to uh, suspend their disbelief and have created a new strain of the, uh, of the whole um, UFO uh, spirituality, a new strain of, of, that, of that whole milieu known as, quote-unquote, Christian ufology. And a central part of Christian ufology is the whole Nephilim thesis. Right. thesis. It's thesis, but it's, the, it's, it's a thesis. It, it, um, uh, it basically, it, it holds in a nutshell that the watchers described in the book of Enoch have come back masquerading as aliens, and they're impregnating people and creating the and creating giants that were described in the book of in, in the book of Genesis, right, and uh, and um, and it, it creates this kind of end time hysteria because yes. because the Christian ufologist frequently cites the play cites the passage in in, in the uh, Gospels where Jesus says, "As it was in the days of in the Noah, days of Noah, so right, it will be in the last days, right, and 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 so whenever and so." And, and, so whenever a UFO appears in the skies, they take that as a sign of the end times. They, yes. They, they take that as a sign that, that the end is nigh, and so you better, you know, be ready however you ready yourself yeah. for this bear, rapture. Bear in mind, bear in mind that, uh, that this uh, interpretation is bereft of any real textual criticism because the enumeration of symptoms for the uh, uh, end that... Uh, or is presented by Jesus, and is com- completely and totally bereft of any mention of genetic experimentation. <laughs> uh, Jesus just said they were giving them marriage. They were giving them marriage and living and making merry. He doesn't say anything like, you know, well, in those days, remember in those days, you know, the watchers were impregnating human women. Right, he well... Says anything like that. I, from my own research, I, I hold to the view of preterism. I, I believe that um, the Olivet Discourse uh, is describing events uh, of that time period, uh, particularly uh, if one believes in the inspiration of those texts, it would be uh, in reference to um, the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah, Simon um, Kotchmar's attempt at uh, the ins- insurrection, which led to the Romans finally saying, that's it, yeah. and tearing it all down, correct? But, but right, uh, but... Um, but even still, I think uh, in, in the German higher critical tradition, uh, those that, if they doubt that the uh, authenticity of those texts, even those traditions as well, uh, believe that um, that the Olivet Discourse is describing uh, contemporaneous events. Uh, not, not now. That's again, I'm not necessarily detracting from the possibility of uh, you know scripture uh, speaking of events to come. I'm just stating that. Right. Uh, when it comes to um, in times hysteria, from my own journey through uh, different religious groups and beliefs, uh, I, I have firsthand uh, had a, a lot of exposure to the uh, pragmatic usefulness of that whole phenomenon as well, which, as you guys know, um, you know very much informs uh, you know patriot militia type groups. Absolutely, it, infor- it, Absolutely. it informs all types of different. This, particularly yeah. in the in the Bible Belt, and it's very useful uh, as a form of fear and paranoia. It makes a lot of money, you know. It, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, here's what concerns us about that. Here's what concerns us about the whole Watcher Nephilim UFO uh, Giants thesis. Um, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, in her Church Universal and Triumphant, also referred to as CUT, had a similar uh, set of beliefs. Prophet, by her own admission, was heavily influenced by Theosophy, by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, right. uh, and by the I Am movement and other Gnostic groups and personalities. 
uh, the Church Universal and Triumphant expressed the concern with two elite combines, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. Now, now there's a large body of evidence, and I'll run this disclaimer right off the bat. There's a large body of evidence proving, in, in our, uh, our, in our uh, opinion, conclusively, that those two particular groups have worked to enrich a semi-submerged oligarchy to the detriment of the rest of humanity. That's, there's no question of that. Profit, however, blended the more, the more far-fetched and paranoid and sensational speculations concerning the CFR and the Trilateral Commission with the Church Universal and Triumphant's religious cosmology. She did this in order to provide that group with a cohesive group identity. And the CFR and the Trilateral Commission, according to Prophet, could be traced back to an extraterrestrial origin. The extraterrestrial source of this conspiracy, according to her, were the Nephilim or Fallen Ones. She asserted that the Nephilim had been building a world dictatorship some 300,000 years ago when they created a slave race of simulated humans. Uh, this slave race was supposedly the product of genetic manipulation and possessed all the traits and characteristics of human beings with one notable exception, the absence of a soul. Uh, the slave race was infiltrated into humanity through interbreeding. Uh, she, she twisted the bi uh, biblical Genesis account, asserting that Noah and his family, which he referred to as light bearers or children of God, were the only ones preserved from this interbreeding. And then she twisted the account again and said that the flood is presented by, it, it's, it was not the wrath of, of a righteous God, but was instead a campaign of weather manipulation and germ warfare that was launched by the Nephilim on this soulless humanity. And following this great flood, the Nephilim uh, supposedly got into spaceships and left, and they returned later and continued their plans to create a world dictatorship. And they continued that, those plans through subversion and intrigue, and they entered into secret agreements and engaged in conspiracies with human collaborators. So once again, and, once again, we have a direct connection between uh, the manip manipulation of a worldview or a belief system, um, a cult, uh, and uh, the UFO phenomenon and different power structures. Absolutely. But she believed that those that the Nephilim and their genetic progeny were very much entrenched in the world's political and social and religious structures. And the only way of escaping the Nephilim's influence, uh, following her, her, her rationale, according to Prophet, was by, quote, coming apart and being separate people, unquote. Now, the Gnostic fundamentalist, uh, including people that we used to be associated with, like, uh, 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 they all they uh, they uh, also called for a nat a radical gnostic uh, divorce from all uh, legitimate social authority and all legitimate ecclesiastical authority. They called for a divorce from community, from the world, and from uh, reality in general, and, and still do. And this is no different from the heretical gnostic sects that you might have seen back in the medieval period of history that would remove themselves from the rest of civilization and attempt to construct some kind of Gnostic commune or some kind of Gnostic republic. And in, in, in an attempt to uh, justify such a radical and Gnostic split with reality, uh, these Gnostic fundamentalists cite Revelation 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 4, where God says to the believers concerning Babylon, uh, quote, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues, unquote. Uh, now, through the interpretational lens of orthodoxy and ancient, ancient Christian, the ancient Christian faith, uh, this particular portion of Holy Scripture is not calling for Christians to physically remove themselves from the rest of the human family. Instead, it's simply telling us not to be participants in the dark and the immoral practices that are commonplace today. Furthermore, Orthodox Christianity seeks to redeem the world. It doesn't escape. It doesn't seek escape, it, 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 to escape it. It's not escapist in nature. Uh, the faith seen through the interpretational lens of ancient Christianity was, in our, our view, it was world affirming. And in uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 21 to 22, we read that the, quote, creation 
itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children uh, uh, of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Unquote. And in prophets' conspiracy theory, we we find threads that would be sown throughout uh, the Christian ufology that that came about and emerged a little bit later. Um, uh, the the, the uh, Church Universal and Triumphant had ties to a group that figures uh, looms very very large in our in our manuscript. A, a group called the World Anti Communist League or WACL. and um, uh, it, the, the Mark, Martin Lasseter, who was a leader in the Church Universal Triumphant, became an editor of Asia Bulletin, which was the uh, publication of the Asian branch of WACL. And again, we see these same intelligence circles involved in the promotion of the ET and UFO myth emerging here. Right. Because Colonel John Alexander, who was part of, uh, was a participant in NITSI, uh, a group set up by Robert Bigelow, a group that was made up, but the nexus of which was made up of former intelligence officers, former intelligence operatives, and, and the like. Um, he, he was, he was, he, he claims uh, General John Singlob as one of his close uh, associates, and at, at his site, he, at Alexander's site, he has a picture of, of himself with, with Alexander, with uh, Singlob, and below the picture in the cut line, it states that Singlob served as Alexander's boss at one time, and uh, Al- uh, Singlob became the head of the American branch of the World Anti-Communist the Communist League in 1981. Now, the outward appearances of the group may suggest in the naive that WACL was just an association of patriots and freedom fighters opposing the communist uh, menace, but um, um, that, that was proven actually false by former U.S. Justice Department lawyer John Loftus and Mark Ahrens, who described described the organization as, as kind of a collection of not, Nazi and Asian war criminals that came together to form a post-war uh, fascist international. And, and uh, researcher Dennis Cuddy also uh, stated that uh, WACL was kind of a cover for, for a, a, a post-war fascist international. He said that it was one of the several pro- perfect places for secret Nazis and their sympathizers to uh, to find uh, find trouble to cover, so again we see these same the, we see these same uh, intelligence circles and, and um, these criminalized portions of the intelligence community that are associated with the UFO deception involved in the, in the uh, creation of of, the, of this of this uh, Nephilim watcher uh, yeah. You know, this, this, this quote unquote Christian ufology. Now that. Go ahead. Oh, I'm, sorry. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jay. Well, I was just going to say that the, you mentioned Bigelow, and in your in your chapter, you you uh, discussed that in reference to Skinwalker Ranch. Oh yes, Skinwalker Ranch, place where every single kind of uh, Portiana Central. Yeah, exactly. Right. It was supposedly taking place everything from. Uh, Bigfoot sightings to right. to orbs to uh, to UFO landings. All of this was taking place there. Uh, the Nitsi group rushed in, took over, and then just basically uh, shrouded the place in in secrecy. They they wouldn't reveal much of the work that was that was going on there, and all. Um, and so it, it it made us question whether whether. Uh, whether the uh, as to, if the, if there if this was just uh, a cover for some kind of intelligence operation there at Skin, Skinwalker Ranch. I mean, Bigelow he came in, comes to the rescue after all this weirdness begins. He offers uh, the Sherman family, which was living there at the time, two hundred thousand dollars for the ranch. Yeah, you know, and and um, and then all of a sudden he, he just surrounds the place with strict media silence and there's no there you know where's the uh 
where where's the openness? Where it, it, yeah, where's the transparency? It, 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 you always hear these UFO groups de- decry the lack of transparency, and yet you know when they go in and they to quote unquote investigate a place supposedly experiencing uh, a lot of a lot of activity, there's no transparency. Um, uh, now, for uh, we we thought that that um, it, it, when when we were looking at the possibility of of Skinwalker Ranch being a some kind of intelligence operation, um, you know, we knew that there were skeptics that would basically, you know, poo poo the whole idea. But those skeptics would do well to consider the case of Tom Slick. Tom Slick was a Texas oil millionaire, and he gained some notoriety as a Yeti searcher. <laughs> and uh, Lauren, Lauren Coleman, who is a cryptozoologist, who has written a lot about Slick. And what Coleman found out was that Slick was a CIA operative who used his search, his, his search for the abominable old snowman as a cover for covert operations. So while he was supposedly out hunting the Yeti, he was, it, that was all just a cover for uh, operations that he was doing in the, uh, in the Cold War world. So Skinwalker Ranch really could be a similar case, a place where paranormal research provides it, provided a cover for, uh, for covert operations. And it would work, too, because something goofy would have the... Um, ability to uh, turn a lot of people off. In other words, it, it, a lot of people would. Dis- God, you know, you, you you hear about orbs, you hear about bigfoot like creatures, and 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 spaceships landing. You're instantly dismissive if you're a normal person. Right. So it's not hard to look the other way and just and just shrug it off. And uh, like like you say, Jay. But in other words, but that that's a brilliant trick because uh, it's it's a great cover. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, brilliant, and, all, and it seems to have worked because, it, 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 well, yeah, like Phil just said, it, it worked at, it worked at, uh, at uh, Area 51 because the wild stories that were, that the wild stories that were coming out of there, you know, drew attention away from real questions right. like, hey, right. why, the, why the hell is Barry Seals the most, the most famous? cocaine smuggler in American history. Why is his fat lady aircraft, why is his cargo plane being seen out there? And, and why, why is it that when, when the plane is finally shot down uh, by Nicaraguan, by, by, the, by the Nicaraguan government, by the Sandinistas, and the Sandinistas retrieve from that craft documents linking that craft with Area 51, you know why? Why is that not why? Why? Why are no questions raised about that? I mean, yeah. Eugene Hossefus, who was the one sole survivor of that crash, doesn't seem to be saying much. Doesn't seem to be talking much. I mean, the government came to his defense and provided him the, with the legal defense, and so he's not, he's not going to exactly be forthcoming with any information. He owes them big time. So. And everything. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a, another great point with the whole uh, Area 51 secrecy and, of course, you know, the news. Yeah, and, the, and, and you're not looking at these questions concerning Barry Seal, right. who was a CIA operative, who also worked with the DEA, who also with Federico Vaughn uh, staged what was supposed to be a Gulf of Tonkin incident, uh, loading, co- loading cocaine onto his plane, and the, the, the pictures that were taken... Of that of of that cocaine being loaded were then attributed to the Sandinistas, and Reagan said, "Hey, you know, look, the Sandinistas are involved in in the uh, in in the drug trade." But as we later found out, Barry Seal was CIA operative. Federico Vaughn worked for Oliver North. You know, none of these questions, none of these interesting. Well, uh, but why why? Well, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Sorry. You've already dismissed the possibility that the aliens are running the cocaine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but, but you see, but that's the thing, is that these stories about aliens out there and these stories about uh, 
genetic manipulation under the ground. They are creating human-alien hybrids and collaboration between humans and, and aliens. Instantly, it's, it instantly makes you dismiss any stories about the place and instantly makes you shrug off anything, including the information concerning concerning SEAL uh, uh, being out there and how, how this place potentially was used as, as a cover for, for one of the one of one of the biggest covert operations in, in, in the history of, of, of intelligence. So uh, a, a covert operation that included uh, it included uh, funding the Southern Front Contras, even Pastora, uh, uh, and and included uh, uh, flooding the streets of, of Los Angeles with drugs through the street gangs in order to to uh, keep the Contras going in their attempt to destabilize the, the Sandinistas. Uh, right. Sandinista, so, which, were, which were putting the power, incidentally, uh, by, by our government, too. The San, uh, so, Somoza was, was let go yes. in favor of the Sandinistas. And, and then uh, and after, uh, after, uh, after Somoza was deposed uh, by, by, our state, by the State Department yes. sponsored Sandinistas, uh, our government began to pick and choose which factions of that revolutionary movement. Well, that's wanted. that's the that's the pattern uh, all over. I mean, that, that's the pattern with Iran uh, when Mossadegh uh, is gone. Uh, it's the Shah, and when the Shah is uh, no longer useful, then uh, the uh, funding shifts to the Ayatollah Kashani, and then it shifts to the Ayatollah Khomeini, and. It, exactly. uh, it's exactly. it's all the same pattern that just works over and over and over. Yeah. And, and that is the important evidentiary threat, not this crap over aliens, because this evidentiary threat points to a points to a group, to a fraternity of people that have the power to overstall and throw the uh, overthrow and then install and then overthrow and then reinstall. Governments in different countries almost at will. Yes, and that's a scary thought. That's a that's a very scary possibility to to uh, to contemplate. Um, but uh, there there well, I don't want to get too far afield. But there's also another connection of the whole UFO myth to Iran Contra uh, that that's important to consider, and that's uh, that's the individual Daniel Sheehan. Daniel Sheehan. Um, he, he was part of the uh, uh, the supposed public interest firm, the Christic Institute. He founded it with the Jesuits, and they brought they brought suit uh, against the uh, against the U.S. government, claiming that uh, that the Latinka bombing, uh, where where uh, which almost uh, led to the death of of um, uh, of Commandante Zero, um, um, of Eden Pastora. That 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 was actually uh, a terrorist action uh, perpetrated by by uh, individuals here, by by Ted Shackley, by George Bush, by individuals who have found that Eden Pastora was no longer useful to their plans, and so now they were trying to get rid of them. Um, uh, well, the the case fell apart. The case fell apart because the. Because the Christic Institute just just did a, a terrible job. This did a terrible job of presenting any kind of evidence that in, in, in court. Uh, but but the interesting thing was was that was that they were that the Christic Institute was was presenting the uh, the Iran Contra fraternity as kind of the embodiment of all that is American. The embodiment of traditionalism, the embodiment of Christianity, so that the the public's mind, uh, the, the uh, in the public's mind, uh, you know, Christianity and conservatism and traditionalism would be equated with criminality, and and uh, the Christic the the Christic uh, Institute received their name from Keeler Deschardins. They were all followers of Keeler de Chardin, the the, uh, wow. uh, the kind of heretical Jesuit priest right. uh, yeah, advanced the uh, uh, evolutionary form of pantheism, right. which seems to be the, the wave of the future in terms of the uh, emergent spirituality right. that arises from 
uh, this whole uh, exogeological. Yes. Um, the, he, he advanced it through uh, cos, uh, the, the theory of cosmogenesis. Right. <laughs> Which, he was a total police state apologist, too. If you read his writings, he, he said that totalitarianism was was necessary. Um, but uh, so, so this... So the uh, Christic Institute's crusade against the, the Iran Contra fraternity actually represented an attempt to destabilize Western thought and Western civilization. That that attempt to uh, to um, to destabilize Western civilization may have continued after the Christic Institute fell apart because their their suit fell apart. They were ordered to pay a million dollars to the to the defendants, and at that part the point they went bankrupt. Daniel Sheehan afterwards went on to represent John Mack, and I've already mentioned John Mack. He was the chairman of the Harvard Department of Clinical Society, uh, the Psychology, and uh, the, the Harvard tried to fire him after he published a paper entitled "Abduction: Human Encounters with Aliens." Um, he tried to publish it through the New England Journal of Medicine. But the editorial board of that of that journal said, "Hell no," <laughs> and, and so that's when he decided to write to write his book. Daniel Sheehan, funded by Lawrence Rockefeller, came to the find it came to the aid of John Mack, and and basically got the uh, got the case uh, got got the case uh, thrown out. He he, he basically uh, defended. Uh, the, 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 got the case resolved, and, and John Mack was saved. And again, John Mack presents abductees as these people who have been chosen to be chosen by these otherworldly creatures to be shaman uh, uh, that that will will guide humanity to a to a new and better spirituality, a new age. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and I think uh, I think you you mentioned at one point uh, Christopher O'Brien, and he mentions in his book on UFOs or one of his books uh, Lawrence Rockefeller as well as being someone very much interested in the usefulness of the UFO mythology. Absolutely, absolutely, and and again the, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, funded the. Uh, funded <coughs> Hadley control and that right. their study group, you know, when that looked into the whole, uh, into the whole Orson or Orson Welles War of the World um, um, phenomenon and studied it as a as kind of a uh, as kind of a case study in, in mass mass panic. Mass yeah. Drama. Well, I mean, this has been uh, a super hyper info packed <laughs> interview, so. What other juicy insights can we expect in the rest of the book? Because, I mean, what you guys sent was, you know, the first few chapters. So I'm eager to know now what, what other big revelations are there. I mean, these are big revelations. I mean, this is heavy stuff. Well, uh, a sizable portion of the book will also be devoted to the emergent spirituality uh, 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 that is uh, arising from the UFO uh, phenomenon. Uh, that, uh, that emergent spirituality... And, and like I said, it, it, it basically, it's basically uh, uh, evolutionary pantheism. Right. Um, and and this, this again, this arises, uh, uh, this is a corollary of the uh, Kantian rift and the privacy of Kantian metaphysics because the Kantian rift upholds the privacy of scientific materialism, which mm -hmm. portrays the ontological confines of the physical universe as the totality of reality itself. Right. And so essentially, the material world is hypostatized. Uh, yes. In the context of this discussion, I invoke that term, hypostasis, as being, uh, 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 being a fundamental self-sufficient reality upon which all else is contingent. But this hypostatic depiction of the universe provides the basis for the virtual apotheosis of material agencies and the enshrinement of amanitism, yes. uh, particularly amanitist uh, 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 Gnosticism. We see, we see uh, uh, divine agency being biologicized, uh, God uh, being, uh, in the words of Eric Bogland, 
drawn into the existence of man, the anatization of the meaning of uh, existence. Um, but um, you have you have within the, the incoherent narrative of scientific materialism this appeal to an infinite regress of contingent agencies imbued with the causative powers of the divine. Obviously, that's a juxtaposition of uh, mutually exclusive terms. Uh, a contingent agency cannot be, by definition, divine because it cannot find in itself its own meaning for being. It, right. It's not subsistent. It's not hypostatic. But we see in, for instance, uh, films such as uh, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which I believe you've done, you did an excellent analysis over. Thank you. Uh, in that film, near the end, uh, we are presented with a visual representation of uh, a tiered, uh, evolutionarily developmental hierarchy of aliens. Yes. Aliens progressing from uh, uh, in, from more anthropomorphic features to less and less uh, anthropic features to more and more foreign, more and more alien features. And what is uh, what this 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 visual representation that Spielberg is setting before us? What is acting as a visual world is the supposed upward ascent of, uh, of uh, human evolution towards something beyond humanity. In right. The words of, of Nietzsche, the, uh, uh, the slaying of man, man overcoming himself. Yes. And that that entire that entire uh, uh, notion that that because spontaneous generation, uh, as according to Stephen Hawking must be a universally applicable principle right. uh, that that uh, life spontaneously generates itself, that contingent agencies uh, are, uh, have these cognitive powers of the divine to, to literally create sentient life. And because that is universally applicable to other worlds, and the evolutionary process of those other worlds have led these extraterrestrial beings along the pathway to apotheosis to the, to the virtual, uh, the virtual uh, 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 deification of their of their race. Yes. And it stands to reason humanity will travel along the same path towards the very same apotheosis. And by the way, <laughs> this is not a marginalized idea. Many of the new atheists espouse right. pantheism, espouse right. evolutionary pantheism. Look at Daniel Dennett, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, his book Darwin's Dangerous Idea, ends with a discussion of none other than Spinoza. Yep. And he basically he uses he, well, he, he basically says that the universe is sacred. It's not sacred. It's not. It's not an anthem. It's not uh, divine in an anthropomorphic sense. It's nothing that he says we can pray to. It's nothing that we can trust in. It's nothing that we can have an intimate relationship with. But it is nevertheless divine in and of itself. You have David Hume, uh, even as far back as the 18th century Enlightenment, saying that the uh, that the material cosmos is in and of itself divine. You have uh, Richard Dawkins, the, 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 the famous uh, uh, New Atheist, saying that all that pantheism is is really, quote unquote, sexed up atheism. Right. Under his words, not right. mine. This leads us to the conclusion that atheism is the self-refuting affirmation of a negative in the absolute. Its chief claim is that there is no God. Now, while many intellectuals and scholars have espoused such a view, it is beset by a very crucial logical contradiction, and that is in order to affirm the non-existence of an omniscient being, one must first lay claim to omniscience itself. Right. And of course, Omniscience is a trait reserved exclusively for deities, and those who lay claim to it must lay claim to divinity. You saw this point being raised in the famous debate between Bertrand Russell and Father Copelston. Yes. In short, the claimant is apotheosized. Thus, atheism actually acts as a philosophical segue for the ontological relocation of God within man himself. With the imposition of the Kantian rift, the diminution of religious ideas and secularization, which really is nothing more than a radicalized demanitism, the rise of the new atheism, now we have the rise of a new spirituality 
from that. Which is evolutionary pantheism and exotheology is just its latest manifestation, its latest incarnation. Which is why the new atheists often uh, will openly speak of aliens. <laughs> right? Yep. And Richard Dawkins has even said that he would rather get his assent to the notion of aliens seeding this world than a transcendent God creating life. Yeah. Francis is correct. The atheist, uh, the um, Nobel Prize winner, came up with the whole idea of the Earth being yeah, pan, 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 pan spermia, pan spermia right? Originated with them. Yeah. So really, what it's dealing with is not really so much the rejection of God; it's the rejection of an ultra mundane God. Yes. And a jihad being waged on behalf of an intra mundane God. Yes. Absolutely. Wow, uh, definitely, <laughs> definitely a killer interview. Um, we're gonna have to definitely get a hold of. The, I'm gonna have to get a hold of this book because uh, Invoking Beyond is gonna be killer. Um, I guess in closing here, where uh, what I want to, I didn't, I didn't include this in the questions. I did ask, I think Philip, <clears throat> uh, or maybe it was Paul, but where is this myth going? In other words, has it? Has it been successful? I mean, on the one hand, we see the continuation of the alien mythos in pop culture everywhere. Every every week, there's a new alien movie that's out. Uh, you know, it, it continues on. Uh, polls show you know half of Americans, fifty, sixty percent. Uh, different polls say different things. You know, believe in the existence of extraterrestrial beings. Blah blah blah. Is it, it has the mythology been successful? Uh, where is it going? Are they going to utilize it? How do how, where's this all going? Well, that's an that is an interesting question. There was recently an article, and I don't recall who had uh, who had wrote it, um, and I apologize for that. I'm groping for the name, but the article was entitled. Um, was entitled, The Truth May Not Be Out There After All, yeah. uh, or, or something along the lines. I'm par paraphrasing the title. Yeah. So, uh, it, was, it was a London Telegraph article, uh, and, it, and it, it, it was, uh, it was uh, basically entitled, uh, uh, UFO Enthusiasts Admit the Truth May Not Be Out There right. After All. Right. And it basically, uh, it, 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 to, to give you a thumbnail of what the article says, it, it basically it basically shows that declining numbers of flying saucer sightings and the failure to establish any definitive proof of alien existence has led many UFO enthusiasts to admit that they may not exist at all and to basically abandon this this, this myth. Um, so what we have is is we have the latest the latest uh, uh, installment in this series of beyonds uh, declining, waning in waning in dominance, waning in its influence. And so what that will lead to is one of two possible outcomes. It'll lead to either a return of, uh, of people to uh, orthodoxy, to uh, traditional religious faith, which we can't, we do see that occurring. Um, in this sense, uh, tradi the traditional monotheistic faiths may actually win the culture war by default because they actually are pro-fertility belief systems. Right. And so far as we can tell, the other belief systems, they they encourage, you know, the use of, of, of uh, contraception and, and abortion and fantasize. Whatever. Right. And so they are not propagating their ilk. However, the traditional monotheistic faiths are. Um, so, it, it, so this decline is this newest, this newest myth, this newest beyond, could lead to a return to, to Orthodox uh, theism, or it could lead to the manufacture of just another beyond. Right. Uh, what that is, we're not quite sure. But there's there never seems to be um, for for uh, the would be oligarchs for those who uh, advance some managerial model. There never seems to be any scarcity of ontologically and epistemologically dwarfing forces that they can invoke right. in order to engender fear and through fear compliance. It's been suggested that that um, the terrorism actually represents a represents a beyond. 
uh, uh, that represents a model of the of the beyond, and it's it it would be a it would be an example of the beyond that is a lot more existential in nature and less theoretical than than a UFO threat, uh, and and we and we see the the, the creation of of just sort of the of a beyond right uh, right now, given this this uh, symbiotic relationship that exists between uh, between the power elite and the uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. They just they, so so that might not that might displace uh, you, the the UFO threat as as the primary beyond uh, for for a time. For for a time, and um, and uh, but, uh, and and basically serve as the the the, uh, the the new threat that that dwarfs us epistemologically, and uh, and has to be deal, dealt with in in, in uh, ways that that, uh, that 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 go beyond uh, our traditional uh, our, our traditional institutions. Uh, uh, so that that's something that will be uh, that will be exploring in the book the possibility that that that's uh, so uh, maybe like a, a return to uh, the uh, Muslim terrorist narrative, but maybe not so much uh, Al Qaeda, but uh, some other incarnation, Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, um, well, well, what's happening is that that the Al Qaeda narrative. Seems to, uh, the, the, that 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 manifestation of the of the, the Al Qaeda manifestation of the narrative, like you say, seems to be waning. A virtual state doesn't make for good hunting after a while. Eventually, it needs to become something a little bit more more tangible, a little yeah. bit more existential, and that might be the reason why we see these uh, these kind of uh, Islamist. Republics being set up in the Middle East, uh, with the help, of course, of our State Department and our and criminalized portions, the, the criminalized portions of our intelligence community, and the Muslim Brotherhood, who the who the the elite deviants have had uh, a symbiotic relationship with for God years, right. going all the way back to uh, Jamal Adin Al Afghani, uh, the atheist, the, the militant atheist, the Freemason posed as some kind of orthodox pious leader who, who, who of, of, in, in the Islamic community who, who created uh, the first wave, the first generation of Islamists, right. uh, the, the, pan, the, uh, the, the pan-Arab movement as, as merely a tool of the British Empire. Right. And, and then, of course, the second, uh, he, he, uh, after, after him and Mohammed, and Mohammed Abda, uh, we had we had the rise of a second generation made up of people like Saeed Kutu and Hassan Al Banna, who uh, who basically uh, transformed the second wave into into the Muslim Brotherhood, which became the trunk of the tree of, of terrorism. Um, uh, it's so uh, that 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 terrorist threat is now is now is now being kind of evolved into. Into pariah nations, into rogue states. Uh, Egypt most certainly will probably become a rogue state sometime in the in, in the future. Um, now that it's been destabilized by our State Department, by Freedom House, by uh, by the National Endowment for uh, for Democracy, by the Muslim Brotherhood, by the CIA, um, and, and so and so that'll be. That will be the new, the new form of the of the narrative. That that not just a virtual terrorism will not just be a virtual state. Terrorism will actually have national national boundaries to it. It'll Interesting. be a rogue state, right? The, uh, pariah nations that we we invariably will have to will 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 have to go to war war uh, with. And uh, you know, no doubt they 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 will be armed and uh, they they they'll probably. Uh, you know, uh, received through proliferation, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Right. And, uh, the, piggy, the piggyback globalist will will latch on to any kind of counter proliferation campaign that takes place as a as a knee jerk reaction. Right. And use it to continue uh, 
to continue building empire. Then we'll have a de- then we'll have a invasion and destabilization, and then we'll set somebody else up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. The Ouroboros eating its tail. Yeah, exactly. It's not exactly nutritious, but it's what's going on. Now, how about I get a little bit speculative here in our close? I want to get you guys' take on this from my own research of. Uh, um, the UFO phenomenon, which I uh, obviously agree with you guys, is uh, manufactured. What about the possibility of the UFO uh, phenomenon also being a cover, uh, or the, the alien uh, myth, if you will, being a cover for uh, secret technological advancement uh, and research? Uh, I know you don't have a problem necessarily with that claim, because obviously that was part of what happened at Area 51, given the recent revelations of the government admitting that yes, there there is an Area 51, but what about the possibility of um, uh, a future um, usage of uh, artificial intelligence uh, in a kind of Skynet situation? And of course, I don't mean to over exaggerate or uh, sensa- uh, sensationalize uh, the situation. Uh, I don't necessarily literally mean a Terminator situation, but something uh, along the lines of Terminator, where uh, I, I think I see where you're going, kind of as a, a kind of a, uh, as cover for the tangible enactment of the transhumanist agenda. Exactly. Yeah, that's a possibility. But I also see it as a possibility as uh, 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 that it's a possibility. One of the possibilities that I entertain is that it's used as a cover for the development of non-lethal weapons. And the reason I, I the reason I say that is I just go back to the central character of Colonel John Alexander, who you uh, who you uh, you know uh, uh, compared to uh, the individual in the, the military man in Twin Peaks. Uh, he he actually uh, was on a, a, a council on foreign relations think tank dedicated dedicated to the uh, study of non of non lethal weapons. And some of the some of the aspects of, of the abduction experience suggest that non lethal weapons were put to use the, the whole paralysis or the feeling of nausea. Uh, so it might have been used as a cover yeah. for the development of more effective uh, uh, devices of non uh, non lethality. Yeah and, uh, and and why would you develop why would you be perfecting those? Why would you be in a rush to perfect those? Because you because in the new world order, all civil, all of all of humanity becomes the native that you have to that you have to civilize. Yeah, you have to subdue. And in addition, in, in, in regards to transhumanism, uh, Jacques Fresco, who I mentioned earlier, Jacques Fresco, uh, who found, uh, founded the Venus Project, was a former member of Technocracy Incorporated. Well, uh, the Raelian movement, which is the largest UFO religion in the world. Uh, um, Basically, uh, basically uh, gave him accolades. Um, I forget what was the name of the, the award that they gave him, but they they revered him as a great man of science. Um, the Raelian movement also uh, has uh, extended uh, 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 extended uh, distillations concerning transhumanism in many of their religious tracts. Uh, their their uh, right. for instance, uh, intelligent design message from the designers. Uh, Rail, uh, the supposed contact, the, the French atheist, uh, who supposedly met these extraterrestrial uh, uh, beings. He discusses <laughs> at length uh, the possibility of uploading consciousness into uh, computers, oh, uh, right. sending biology, uh, uh, cyber biological augmentation of the human being, and again, basically hearkening back to uh, the Nietzschean. Uh, notion of uh, slaying humanity and overcoming himself, man becoming the 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 the, the Ubermensch. Right. Um, you also you also uh, have uh, uh, you also you also have uh, a trans a techno progressive and something of a transhumanist himself, Williamson Stainbridge, um, who is also a member of the National Science Foundation. He conducted a five-year ethnographic study of the. Uh, the satanic cult of process church and he uh, adopted their uh, he adopted their concept of uh, religious engineering what they call it religious engineering which is the skilled systematic creation of a brand new religion uh. and he actually advances uh, the notion of 
active experimentation with scientific cults, particularly UFO cults, in the creation of a new religion, which yes. uh, he, he believes will facilitate uh, the uh, uh, exploration of space and being sent to the stars, which um, is, uh, it, 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 it kind of reiterates the soteriological view of, of space that Carl Sagan uh, advanced. Right. Carl Sagan uh, viewed uh, humanity's, uh, humanity's uh, ascent to the stars as being the agency of his survival. And of course, within the secular theodicy of Darwinism that he advanced, right. survival constitutes salvation. Yes. And so you have the, the, the soteriological nature of space exploration. And uh, we, should, we didn't mention it, but uh, I guess it's worth mentioning as well the odd connections of uh, L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology with its whole alien mythos and Hubbard's yeah. Hubbard's background with uh, Crowleyanism, and then there's also the Heaven's Gate cult uh, with Marshall Applewhite and his odd right. connections. He, 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 right in the Process Church, which which uh, which uh, Williamson's Bridge conducted the ethnographic study over, was a result of the skin of a schism within Scientology. And, and right. um, uh, he, of course, Hubbard found uh, of course Hubbard founded uh, Scientology. And, um, and, and um, uh, I can't think of his name now, the, the writer of the game player, Miles Copeland, a CIA operative, he, he uh, uh, reached out, he suggested that the Central Intelligence Agency reach out and make connections with Scientology as part of a, a, a program that he called um, uh, 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 OHP, a call, which is an acronym for Occultism in High Places. So the Central Intelligence Agency ended up reaching out to Hubbard and moral rearmament and different uh, astrologers and fortune tellers in the Washington, D.C. area that catered to uh, different political elites and began making strong, strong connections, uh, strong connections there. So, I, I mean, again, you, you have this, this connection of the uh, of the whole um, uh, the whole u- u- ufology field and the whole ex- and the whole realm of the exotheology again to uh, to um, uh, to the intelligence community because Scientology does have a strong alien component to its right. uh, to its whole theology. Well, that they, I, I, I sent you that Daily Mail article that had uh, a recent. Uh, they just built a big Scientology center somewhere, and it's next to an an alien la- landing pad. <laughs> yeah, uh, another uh, sci- another inter- in- 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 interesting uh, connection between uh, uh, with Scientology and all of this is Hal Putoff. Hal Putoff, uh, of course, was one of the uh, characters that were part of the National Institute of Discovery Sciences uh, with with John B. Alexander and with Robert Bigelow. Hal Putoff had uh, has done had done work for the CIA, and he is re- reportedly a, uh, a a Scientologist. Uh, but um, Martin Cannon, when Martin Cannon wrote his book, um, uh, The Controllers, uh, Hal Putoff and and um, Hal Putoff and uh, John P. Alexander were apparently infuriated with him, and. Uh, Martin Cannon claims that he received a phone call that was recorded uh, from from John B. Alexander's wife, where Al- where where she basically says, "Hey, uh, to paraphrase, hey, uh, uh, John and and Hal are are pissed off at you, and and so Gordon, uh, where Gordon's going to deal with this situation? Uh, yeah, now that's that's a that's that's a uh, I don't have to quote in front of me. That's a paraphrase." So who she was referring to was Gordon Novell, the individual that was planted in um, in um, the, uh, uh, Jim Garrison's office. And he, he supposedly came on as a counterintelligence guy, as a security guy that was supposed to make sure that nobody uh, was able to destabilize his investigation of the JFK assassination. But he ended up. Uh, working for the uh, for the other side, he ended up working for the for the FBI and, and passing information to the FBI that helped them uh, successfully uh, 
successfully uh, destabilize uh, um, Jim Garrison's investigation. And so again, you know, we have these these connections between the dark, criminalized portions of the intelligence community with the whole uh, the whole UFO crowd, right? So the whole space alien crowd and everything. Well, in my in my mind, I'm, no, I'm just in my mind. This is pretty much a, a, a. I mean, it's a pretty obvious open and shut case. I mean, I don't necessarily discount the possibility of, you know, uh, other phenomenon or strange phenomenon going on in the world, but when it comes to the, uh, you know, all the harm, hallmarks of what characterized the UFO phenomenon, I mean, we just constantly see. Uh, you know the human element all throughout, and I think that right. basically bespeaks nothing but a big uh, con. Right, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm the same way. I don't necessarily dismiss the idea that some of this phenomena is attributable to what uh, what the uh, the French metaphysician uh, René Guénon described as cracks in the great ball. You know, uh, mm -hmm. the, this. This wall that had been created between the subtle plane and this plane by materialism and uh, atheism and, and secular humanism, and now those those cracks are starting to to appear in the Great Wall because it's become just too solid, and cracks always appear on the lower end, so inferior as infrapsychic beings may be pouring in, and they may appear to us to be aliens. I don't, I don't discount that, but every time that we look at this, we see, we, we, we detect traces of humanity yeah. in, in, the, in, in the UFO occupants. We, we detect traces of human technologies in, in, the, in, the, in the craft that are described. And, you know, and, and so, again, you know, I, I think like you that it's an open, an open and shut case. And, and going back to your contention that this might all be a cover for transhumanism, Jay, now when I think about it, that section in Bernard Newman's book where he describes deceased aliens and saying that, uh, the, you know, the, saying that the, these deceased aliens are merely, uh, you know, anthropomorphic facsimiles made up of, of animal cadavers, well, that just smacks of transhumanism because we, yeah. we always hear about the, the, the transplantation of, 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 animal, uh, of animal parts with human parts and, 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 and <laughs> right. you know, the creation of, of something beyond human uh, using, using different parts of animals' anatomy, anatomy and, uh, and, 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 and within the transhumanist uh, uh, world. Yeah, well, the aliens always want to cut up. They always want to cut up cows. So, well, this has been great. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, the writings of the Collins brothers can, of course, be found at conspiracyarchive.com. And uh, when uh, do we have any tentative date on uh, when we can expect invoking? I am hoping. I'm hoping that that, that this will. This ready to go sometime uh, uh, mid next year. Um, I, I, the, we, we started it in 2006. I was not happy with how the uh, original manuscript was, uh, how it was coming out. Um, so we uh, didn't revisit it until uh, 2011 and uh, started to refine the thesis and more uh, cogently articulate it. Um, so it, it's been a long time coming, plus professional and personal obligations sure. have, have really stultified progress. But uh, we now start, I think we're starting to hit our stride. I hope to God that's the case. Um, we, we, we have some very demanding jobs right now. Right. But um, that notwithstanding, we are determined to finish this. So hopefully sometime in next year, that, that's the best that I can do. Uh, do expect uh, possibly some excerpts being released on Terry Malonson's uh, Conspiracy Archive. That should wet people's uh, palates considerably. Excellent. And we'll just pray to God that some crap doesn't land on the White House lawn between them. <laughs> well, I hope you guys don't get abducted and uh, have to have to deal with anal probes. and. <laughs> yeah, that, that, uh, the whole prospect of that is very 
unenticing. Uh, we, I, I'm already working in corrections now. So <laughs> it's prison. Uh, you know, we, we, I get enough. Correctional yeah. officers, we've already had enough of uh, uh, human victimization. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> good. <laughs> Let's not even go there. That's too lurid. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, guys, and uh, we look forward to uh, another interview in the near future with the Collins brothers.